The views, comments, stories, and opinions shared within this podcast are our own or those of our guests and in no way represent the views of the companies, associations, or organizations that any of us may work for or represent. All stories, events, and tales shared within this episode may or may not have happened in the manner in which they were told. They may or may not have even happened at all. The details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. This is Squawk Ident. We just had an earthquake here. Just let me know if you still would like to land. Uh, that's affirmative. We would still like to land. 39 to 1463. And 1463. Roger. Only 30 left. Good land. Good land. 30 left. United 1463. Uh... You're listening to Squawk Eyed In, an aviation podcast that explores the many pathways to an aviation profession, the challenges that a professional aviator can expect in today's marketplace, and we share many stories along the way. I'm your host, Aviator Tony, a professional airline pilot currently flying for a U.S. legacy airline with close to 20 years out on that flight line. Welcome aboard Flight 121 of the Squawk Ident podcast, recorded on the 30th of October, 2022, from the Aviator Sound Studios from somewhere in Southern California. On today's flight, I'm joined by Squawk Ident co-host Alex D., Together, we will discuss snakes on the plane, regional airlines merging with main lines, and life-saving advice for flight instructors and student pilots alike. We will have these conversations and more with today's featured guest. He is a professional airline pilot, a rock star musician, a father of two adorable children, and he is going to tell us on how losing a job from his previous career allowed him the opportunity to go back to school and choose a career none of his friends even knew he was interested in pursuing. Today, we will hear about Bill M's journey in aviation and his thoughts on today's topics. So stick with us as we cover all this and more on this, the 121st episode of the Squawk Ident Podcast. Joining us today is an exceptional aviator and Squawk Ident co-host. He is a U.S. Navy Reserve's Chief Information Systems Technician, a certified flight instructor, and an Embraer 175 pilot for Sandpiper Regional. The alias we use here on the show as one of Legacy's wholly owned regional airlines. Joining us from his home in Temecula, California, where the Halloween party hangover is kicking in. Help us in welcoming back to the show, Mr. Alex D. Alex, how you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Um, the hangover is not so real. Uh, just went to a Halloween party last night and had to, uh, you know, be the responsible one and drive home so I didn't have to get too bad of a hangover but uh wait, good. Wait, wait, wait. if you were the driver if you were the designated <laughs> driver well, you should have zero hangover point zero I, I, zero buddy i had like three beers so i don't have a hangover per se i'm just tired you're just getting older and three beers hits you a lot more yeah that's exactly what happens <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm glad you had a good time and got out and uh, with with friends and the family and, and got to share in some Halloween festivities. Yeah, yeah. Here, uh, not much going on on my end. Uh, I got tagged with jury duty about three weeks okay. ago, <laughs> about right right after the, uh, the the previous podcast here on episode uh, 120. Um, I got a summons and I thought uh, my friends were saying, "Just throw it away, just throw it no. away." And, no. I, and I thought, no, man, I got to at least show up. I'll probably get out of it. You know, I'll just, you know, they'll, they'll, if they pick me, if they don't let my group go, because that's what they do. They put you in a room. Uh, they give you a group number. You know, there's probably a couple hundred people in the room. And group one, go here. Group two, you can go home. Group three, they settled. So you can go home. Group four, no, nope, go upstairs. So my group got called. And, uh, you know, and then you sit in the room and you go through the preliminaries and and it, cause any, does anybody uh, have a hardship of being here? And I started listening to all the other people and a lot of those excuses. I mean, some were valid, but most of them were such BS. And I just thought, you know what? It's my duty. I'm not going to try to come up with some excuse this time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they looked at me and they're like, hmm, so what do you do? Uh, I'm an airline pilot. Huh. Okay. So they asked me, you know, a couple of questions and, uh, Anybody in your family ever been arrested for anything? Uh, no. You ever committed a crime? Uh, no. Yeah, we like you. <laughs> so, the next thing you know, I'm uh, I'm in the middle of a of a court a criminal case. I can't really talk about it, uh, but um, yeah, Monday through Thursday, I'm in court at the uh, courthouse, and I'm a juror. So, yeah, it's an interesting experience, and uh, I didn't have to go to work. 
Yeah. Uh, and the well, company pays you for your jury duty experience. So whatever flying I was originally scheduled to do, they removed me from that flying and I am getting paid through the uh, jury duty code and, and life is good. Must be nice to not fly. I've been uh, picking up a lot of flying this last month. I can imagine. You know, did you reach your consolidation yet? Yeah, I, I consolidated at the beginning of the month on my first trip, actually like on like the second leg of that trip. So, um, but I was on a uh, long call sandpiper, uh, for the first time ever put long call, uh, reserve lines out. So 12 hour call outs. Mm -hmm. Um, I bid it for some stuff that's going on in my life and, uh, needed a specific day off. And that worked out to be one of my days. And I was like, cool, I'll try it. Except it's the first time that it's ever been done. So crew scheduling has no clue how to treat a long call reserve person. What do you mean? They, so normally, like you're supposed to get 12 hour call outs or you're not supposed to sit wrap or we call it wrap, but it's the two hour call out or standby at the airport. And yet I get a few calls saying like, oh, hey, you're you're assigned a two hour call out tomorrow. And I'm like, um, no, nice try. And they're like, but you're on reserve. I'm like, yeah, long call. And then you hear the keyboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, yeah, you are on long call. Never mind. You don't need to come to Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, but, you know, we, we, we feel your pain because here at Legacy, also at the mainline carrier, uh, these kind of instances where crew scheduling, maybe whoever's on the phone, they didn't really verify or check things appropriately and they'll try to pull stuff like that. So it's important, as we've always discussed on this show for years now, know your contract, know what your rights are and know what to do because the the second you go against that and just go, Oh yeah, I'm going to help the company out. Sure. No problem. Which is great. Great attitude to have, right? Cause we're professional and you know, that's the kind of people we are as, as professional pilots. But uh, once you start doing, you set a precedence and then they're going to call the next person and try to pull that crap. And then that person might go, wait a minute, you can't do that. Um, Oh, I'm going to talk to my supervisor. So yeah, always know your contract. So no, it's been good. I've been flying. Um, the only one thing I'll say, and then we could, you know, move on to our wonderful guest. Uh, there was an episode a while ago where I said, oh, I get to go to uh, Monterey, California. And this is cool because it's full circle. Well, I read the, the name of it wrong. And Monterey, California is M-R-Y. Mm -hmm. And the airport that I ended up going to was M-Y-R. Oh. It's Myrtle Beach, complete opposite side of the country. Well, Myrtle Beach However, is nice. Yeah. It's nice. It was just a quick turn. However, this last trip that I just did, I finally got to go to Monterey. Oh, and did you get the clam chowder in the bread bowl? No, we, we were, uh, I think we were out at like noon. So like we couldn't really like, we, I got the good, amazing free breakfast at that uh, oh, hotel. Did, did it at the oh. Doubletree? I know it's the, uh, we're at the Hyatt Regency. Oh, is that the one with the golf course? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, they changed the name. It used to be definitely. Uh, oh. Yeah, and you have access to the uh, to the the lounge. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That we when I was at uh, Sandpiper, uh, we lost that privilege because of <laughs> some flight attendants that were insisting on um, bigger glasses of wine. I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, we we got in last night and we or we got in that night and we just all kind of just like went to our rooms and kind of slam click because it yeah. was like we spent it was a four hour flight like with the headwind that we had. So everybody was tired. Just to wind up that rubber band a little tighter, man. Come on. You know, we tried. We had a hundred <laughs> something knot headwind going there. And then on wow. the way back, we had a hundred and something knot headwind to Dallas. So, or tailwind to Dallas. So it was, yeah. yeah. And you made up for it. Well, yeah. Uh, speaking of, uh, you mentioned our, our featured guest today. And I'm very excited. Uh, he and I go way back. Uh, today, we are very proud and honored to be joined by a gentleman who is an exceptional aviator and a Wisconsin native. He graduated with a degree in mass communications from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He is a rock star musician where he slings his ax for such bands such as Powder Monkey in Madison, Sweet Polly in Milwaukee, and Inami, I hope I'm saying that right, Inami in Phoenix, Arizona. His degree in mass communications led him to a reporting gig for the Monami Falls News. That's a tongue twister. Later, he uh, found himself reporting for Sussex Sun News, 
His passion for aviation lay dormant until a public relations job and a downturn in the economy led him to a flight school in Arizona, formerly known as Pan Am International Flight Academy. He was eventually assigned a young CFI student, where you might know him. He's actually on this show. His name's Aviator Tony. He was hired on at Sandpiper in 2007, where he was typed in the Saab 340, later the Embraer 145, and the CRJ 700. In 2018, he accepted a flow through to Legacy Airlines, where today he is a first officer on the A320 family of aircraft out of the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Mr. Bill M. Bill, how you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for the intro. <laughs> yeah, that was like, there's some, I don't know what it is about the uh, the Midwest and their the names of their things. I guess it has a lot to do with like the Native American roots. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But uh, there's always a good challenge, uh, especially up in Wisconsin, lots of. Oh, lots of uh, tongue twisting names. Oh yeah, don't you know? <laughs> oh yeah, don't you know? Oh yeah, go pack, eh? Hey, yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> One of my favorite layovers when I was at Sandpiper actually was Madison. Um, the location was fantastic. The, the the university was right there. You can go run around one of the lakes and and then afterwards, you know, drop into the student union and grab a couple of cheap beers. I mean, come on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, with the legacy, I still go to Madison once in a while. Um, we're on the opposite side of the square, but still right in that same area. Mm -hmm. So it's a, and then I get to go visit family and. Yeah. Do you still have a lot of family up there? Yeah. My parents and uh, sisters live up there and grandma. Ah, nice. And that's one of the benefits of being an airline pilot. And once you get settled into a professional career and you could potentially bid layovers where you can go and visit grandma and grandpa exactly um and as you get more senior yeah then you might actually get the ones that you want rather than <laughs> yeah i once i got more senior at the uh um regional that i used to work at i'd bid so that'd be in the winter i'd head to the south and in the summer i'd head to the north and you know yeah. just kind of have a seasonal seasonal layovers yeah Pay attention, Alex, because, I mean, that was the big thing, at least back then. Um, you know, if you were on a good fleet that had a lot of destinations out of your domicile, in the wintertime, that's exactly what we did. Um, I can remember I'd, I was senior enough as a, as a young FO that I could bid all the Miami flying out of my base, which was Chicago O'Hare, in the wintertime. So October through February, I was bidding nothing but trips that touched Miami, had a Miami layover, were downtown at the Sherry or something like that. And meanwhile, my buddies are all up in Chicago de-icing, and and I only touched Chicago on day one, on the on the kickoff flight, and on day four on the go home leg. And the rest of the time, I was down south, and I was like, okay, this is awesome. Seniority has its privileges. Um, hey, I'm just happy to hold the line. Okay, like. I, I'm only four <laughs> months in. I'm just happy to actually hold the line, not like, you know, be unreserved. So yeah. I'll take what I can get at this point. Yeah. But I mean, that's what I'm saying is, you know, you're, you're four months in. And I think by the time the holiday season goes through, I think you're going to be holding a pretty nice commutable line, possibly, yeah. at least for now until everything gets settled. And, and uh, yeah. Well, this, this next month, I do have a nice commutable line every trip. So I have no complaints. Oh. Fantastic. Welcome to the commute. <laughs> I haven't been uh, paying attention to that part of uh, Sandpiper. Do they still do hard lines or is it on PBS? We're, we're still hard lines. We're, okay. um, we use um, a third party app to kind of help us go through everything oh, because sure. reading those bid packets is a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> everybody was there. Everybody remembers it. So, but we have this wonderful program that somebody created that takes all our bid lines and makes it so that you can actually like see what the month is going to look like. Oh, you can sort them. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's basically PBS without being PBS. Oh wow. Yeah. yeah but we nice. still have to bid the hard lines and, you know, do it that way. Uh, do you have to pay for that app? Five bucks a month. Yeah, it's basically, it's basically enough so that they can keep doing what they're doing. 
and everybody uses it. So, I mean, if you're getting five bucks a month from our pilot group of like 2000 people, I mean, that's a decent chunk of change that you're making. I'll pay the rent. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, Bill, let's, let's kick off into your career. Now from your intro, you know, the first time we met, let's just start there. Uh, it was the 30th of March, 2005. And I know this date down to an exact science because this morning as I, as I got up, I thought, you know, I got to look back at my very first logbook. I've got about four or five of the big professional ones, but this is my very first Cessna <laughs> that looks familiar. pilot training oh, center man. logbook. And I have, I have a little posted in here. I, I actually knew that you were my first CFI instructor. So I went back and I found a signature <laughs> that oh, matched the very last one. We flew together for the first time on the 30th of March. We flew a PA-28-181. Okay, is that a, that's the Archer, is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. November Archer. 925 Papa Alpha. And on that day, you introduced me to CFI right seat, turns around a point, steep spiral, and traffic patterns. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it like it was yesterday. Oh, I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and that's when, when we met and we did the niceties. And I think in pilot training, when you're at a flight school that are often looked down upon by the masses, you know, the pilot group, they go, oh, you went to a flight farm like Pan Am, you know, other, other flight farms out there, you know, there's like Emory Riddle. Um, and, and there's plenty of others that I could mention, but, um, you're often kind of given a negative connotation, like, oh, you know, they're just, they stay in their bubble and you're not really learning anything. You're not, you're not flying, but like one or two different types of airplanes and you're, you're well protected and, and that's true. But I think that what they teach you also the way they, at least the way Pan Am was operating, where you had to check your schedule at 5 PM the night before to find out who you're flying with and at what time. Because they said, hey, that's what it's going to be like when you're on reserve at an airline. So we're, we're training you now. And if you can't hack it now in flight school, you're not going to hack it for an airline. Um, and it was really catered for that. And, you know, when we first met, you know, we're in a pre-brief and we're finding out a little bit about each other. And, you know, you sit there and as the student is taking off and, you know, getting up to cruise and figuring out, okay, let's go to the practice area. Do you know how to get there? Yes. Okay. Fly this heading at this altitude. Okay, great. And now you have a few minutes to talk and we would chat. That's when you told me how you're a musician and in a band in Arizona. And, uh, I thought oh, that's pretty cool. And he's a pilot. <laughs> I didn't know you could do both. <laughs> so what, do you remember any of that, that, that time? Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, in a band called enemy at that time. And we'd play shows around the uh, Phoenix area. Um, but, uh, you know, F, that band kind of dissolved as bands often do and tried to put together some other bands. And, you know, I'd get three or four, you know, a couple people together. But, you know, you can never find that missing, the missing link. Yeah. Um, so after that, it, once I actually got into the uh regional world the schedules were so unpredictable that it really made it kind of a lot harder to get into a band and you know with people with normal jobs yeah normal people <laughs> so <laughs> the let, nine let, to five so you didn't start out in aviation like from the get-go you you like me you know had a career change and decided hey, i'm gonna go yeah. fly airplanes now how did this passion for aviation start with you did it start at a very young age and you just kind of was in the background or was it something else? Uh, when I was little, little, you know, up until like junior high or so, I was convinced I was going to be an astronaut. Oh. So, uh, but that never obviously happened. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I definitely took a different route. I, you know, I remember being a kid and playing with, you know, the GI Joe jets and, um, you know, all the planes and stuff flying them around. But I never, it was never something that I thought, oh, I can go do this because at the time it seemed that it was more of, you know, if you go to the military, that's how you get to be an airline pilot. Right. And uh, I had a creative streak in me, obviously, with music and I like writing as well. And I ended up going into uh, 
mass communications and becoming a newspaper reporter, which for the most part isn't all that creative. Um, but you get to write feature stories once in a while. I got my scuba diving uh, certification doing that. Got to um, like go to rock wall climbing and yeah, you know, do some fun stuff. Mm-hmm. But back then and probably now as well, uh, it does not pay well at all. Um, and so I was trying to make some more money. Um, I decided to try uh, public relations and that didn't work out very well. It was 2000, 2001. I lost that job and I was just putting out resumes all over the place. And most of the time I wasn't even getting rejection letters. That's just how bad it was at that point. And, uh, my wife and I took a trip. We, uh, went to visit her sister. We were living in Milwaukee at the time and her sister lived in Cincinnati. And, uh, you know, we got on the plane and we're heading out there and just something kind of clicked there. I'm like, Oh, you know, I like to travel. I like planes. I wonder if I could be a pilot and just start looking into it. And, you know, I realized there's a couple different ways of doing it. You know, found out about flight schools, found out about, you know, like the flight school we went to and also just uh, like FBOs. And at that point I was, you know, 27. I'm like, well, I want to get this going as fast as I can. And, you know, it was the, what? you know, one year, zero to hero kind of thing. Right. So July of 2001, I got in my uh, little Geo Metro with no air conditioning and drove from Wisconsin to, (laughs) to uh, Phoenix. And uh, along the way, the catalytic converter separated from the exhaust. So (laughs) it was a really loud, loud drive. It's like a motorcycle. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Right. Uh, you know, it was already a three-cylinder car to begin with. So right. like, I went through the mountains of Colorado and just like, come on, you can do it. Um, <sighs> but uh, yeah, and then I went and uh, got to Arizona and uh, lived with my uh, in-laws. They lived down in southern Phoenix and I would drive every day in that heat in my car with no air conditioning oh to go God. up to uh, <laughs> up to Deer Valley, North Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah, and I'd be drenched by the time I got there. Wow, that's I mean, damn, that damn, story. Damn. I mean, I could totally <laughs> picture it. You know, a newspaper guy down on his luck, you know, driving this rusted out <laughs> Geo Metro, this three banger. You know, bop, 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 bop. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but but you you your your story is not that uncommon. I think a lot of us, especially at that time, uh, around in the two thousands, early two thousands, that got into this career field into aviation had a very similar story that, you know, things were, you know, looking pretty good. All you had to do is go to a flight school and interview them basically, and then sign your name on the dotted line and owe them hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and you could get your <laughs> right. zero to hero. And they, they said 10 months. And, and I remember when I went to uh, Deer Valley for my orientation, my interview of them, um, the guy who was there, you know, new student counselor or whatever, he was like, and all our airplanes have air conditioning. So, you know, all the other <laughs> flight schools, they don't have air conditioning in their airplanes and you're just going to die and sweat in that little, you know, easy bake oven, but we have air conditioning. And I was like, this is really cool. Maybe it's a little more expensive, but yeah, it's 104 <laughs> degrees outside. I'll have air conditioning. And then later I found out, yeah, you cannot use the air conditioning unit for taxi takeoff and landing. <laughs> it's like, well, that's right. when I need it. <laughs> So, so you, you enrolled now the, you were married at the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No we kids, had, uh, no kids yet. No, no okay. kids yet. Yeah. And your wife, wife was okay a, with this. Yeah. Uh, she was working, uh, she's an attorney. And so she actually stayed up in Wisconsin, you know, it was gonna be 10 months. We're like, okay, well long distance for a little while and yeah, it'd be no big deal. And, uh, you know, as they say in the, in the field, uh, timing is everything. I went in July 2001, and uh, I think I was going for my either stage check or cross-country check out something. And my wife called me up, and she's like, uh, turn on the news. Mm. And, you know, we all know what happened then. Yeah. So. And, and uh, were you grounded for a long period of time, or you were still working on your ratings? So. 
yeah, I was just working on my private pilot yet at that point. So, so we were grounded for a little while and, uh, they kind of moved a lot of the operation down to, uh, Casa Grande. Oh, really? Yeah. Is that because of the FBI involvement with the, uh, the pictures on the wall that I heard about? You, I think you told me about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it, they were trying to get us out of the uh, 30 mile ring around uh, Sky uh, Harbor. Okay. So, yeah, because I think everything had to be, uh, have a, had to have a flight plan, had to have a, I think a I squat code flight plan at that point. Yeah. 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 So, a little backstory so, on that. Anybody um, doing? It was, you were there, but it was before my time. I remember a lot of the flight instructors educated me on the process. So, I too was working on my private pilot license before 9-11. I think we started like right around the same time. I think I started around November of 2000 for mine. Um, but I was just going to a mom and pop FBO in Albuquerque at the time, flying on the weekends only and and doing that. And then, you know, the 9-11 happened. And then I ended up after a few months after that, I was working on my instrument rating. And I finally said, you know what, what am I doing? I'm just going to do a zero to hero thing in 10 months. And because I, I too was like 26, 27 years old. And I thought, man, I, I better get in there because I'm, you know, not some fresh kid right out of high school or college. I, I should get in there. And I was educated on Pan Am's history. Uh, a few of the pilots from 9 11 uh, came in with a student visa from overseas and they were getting their aviation education at some of the flight schools in the Phoenix Metroplex area. Um, Rob. Our, our very own Rob D has told us stories here on the show about the flight school that he attended at Phoenix Sky Harbor. He actually has a, a video still image that the FBI showed him when they interviewed him of him walking out of the flight school and one of the terrorists that was involved in 9-11 walking into the flight school. And they're like, do you know this guy? Have you ever seen him before? Looks like you're having a conversation. It's like, I was just saying hello. You know, um, it's pretty scary. And, yeah. you know, we, the Pan Am Flight Academy, which is no longer Pan Am Flight Academy, it's been changed names like two or three times, I think now, but um, at the time was one of the biggest in the Valley and a few of the participants in 9-11, the terrorist participants, um, got some of their flying education there. And they had oh, pictures on the wall, eight by 10 photos of all the graduates uh, up in the, I think it was in the ready room or, or one of the briefing rooms and yeah you guys i remember one, it might have been you told me yeah they the fbi came in took all those photos down off the wall and closed the shop and interviewed all the chief pilots and it's a big deal do, do you remember that <laughs> uh no i don't i think i was because i was down and doing a lot of the flying in casa grande i didn't come back up to the uh airport around that time at all mm -hmm for a couple of months at least. Yeah. And I can remember so. another time uh, we had a, the monsoon season would hit in, in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And one time it rained so much, so quickly that all flights were canceled for the day because the actual, uh, the, the, the flight school, uh, whatever they called that, what was the front desk? Dispatch desk. The whole floor flooded with two inches of water the whole airport was flooded with two inches of water um and we were all all the students and instructors were in there with squeegees and mops trying to <laughs> get, them, <laughs> yeah. get them all out there uh those are some fun times do you have a favorite memory of your flight training portion over there um from the flight training uh you know it feels like it's so long ago i don't remember a heck of a lot of it i i remember some the mistakes that I've made more than anything, which, you know, those aren't, <laughs> aren't the greatest memories. Um, I remember when we did, um, I guess the funnest times were when it was just you and another student doing the uh, dual time, pretending to be an airline and uh, doing long cross countries to, you know. Oh, the under other the hood. Places. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we found a, I guess the flight school found a loophole that um, if you're both rated to build time to get your commercial rating, the method they would do that is they would put two students together, usually at night, and they'd throw them in a, an airplane. And one student would be, the flying student would be under the hood, and the student that was, because it's VFR, uh, looking out to avoid 
and give directions mm -hmm. to the student that's under the hood, the student under the hood could log simulated instrument time and the lookout pilot would log PIC time because they're looking out. And so both yeah. pilots got to log time to build time. And so that's what they would call those uh, time building flights or whatever they were called. Yeah. It, it created some problems and they had a few accidents uh, because of that. Um, and I don't think they still allow that. Do they, Alex? They still do. Um, some of the, the, the pilot farm schools still do that. It's just, they do it in a different way where you're not under the hood anymore. Oh. Um, you're just like a, a crew and it's in the time build phase for them. And they just, you know, basically pick up their plane and go fly somewhere and, you know, mm -hmm. stay overnight and then the next day they swap seats and go fly somewhere else and land and stay overnight and swap seats and just keep doing that until and they, they both get back. to log uh the flight time uh the one flying does get to log the flight time i don't know what the other one gets to log um i'll have to i actually have to reach out to one of my buddies who went there uh, and talk to him mm -hmm. and see but i can i can find out yeah i think that's you know, that it created issues. There were a few incidents, uh, especially with uh, Pan Am uh, Flight Academy, mm -hmm. where they had, uh, I think it was three students. Uh, one was in the back seat, and they were flying over Southern California. The incident happened just off my memory, um, without doing any research on it, to refresh it. Uh, there were, all the airplanes were designated uh, November, number, 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 and then Papa Alpha, right? The, the traditional Piper aircraft tail number. And coming in through SoCal, uh, because they would have multiple flights leaving Phoenix, Deer Valley, going into, I think it was Long Beach. Uh, and then they would have to it was go... was Carlsbad. Was it Carlsbad? I think so, yeah. And then the, the Julian VOR, was that the one in question? At the top of the yep. mountain there, uh, southwest uh, of Palm Springs. And the Julian yeah. VOR has a minimum crossing altitude because it's in the top of a mountain. And allegedly, the, the story behind it is there was an air traffic controller working the late shift. Uh, I don't know the details, but I was told a few different things like, you know, over, over time or not enough breaks or something like that. And uh, he gave a three pop alpha to send to whatever it was. And there were multiple th three pop alphas. There was like November, I think, four, two, three pop alpha. and four, four, three pop alpha. Well, he just said three pop alpha and both of them replied, but the controller only heard the one. So one aircraft had already passed the Julian VOR and were descending clear of terrain. The second aircraft, the trailing aircraft was flying eastbound and had not quite reached the Julian VOR and they started descending incorrectly. Now talk about loss of situational awareness from the pilot's perspective. Uh, not following along their location on a VFR sectional chart to ensure that any direction given by ATC is not an incorrect one uh, because they gave them an altitude that was lower than the minimum crossing altitude of that VOR. And they hit the top of the mountain, the second aircraft, and they could have cleared it if they were only 16 feet higher. So just at the ridge. Yeah. Um, and of course, I believe all three on board perished. Uh, they were foreign uh, student pilots from Italy, I believe, um, and it was a very, very dark day for the yeah. academy. Um, where you, you were there during that time, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And did I get that right? The the explanation? Yeah, for yeah, I think so. Um, I think there was a call between when the original call went out, and then the. Um, ATC gave it another clearance to some other aircraft, and I think the first aircraft, someone queried, was that for us? And mm -hmm. the instruct or the ATC said, no, that was for this third plane. That so there's just like a loss of communication there as well. Yeah, from what I've heard. Yeah, and and it just it's a it's a tragedy when student pilots. You know, unfortunately, this is not the show that we, we do here. We don't talk about aircraft accidents and incidents. There's plenty of other shows out there that will explore 
the news of aviation accidents and incidents. And um, we'll let them <laughs> dive into what happened there. But being as this was kind of a, a connection um, with us here on the show with you, Bill, um, being at Pan Am at the time, um, these kind of things happen. And we all, and it's important that we remain diligent and vigilant and, you know, follow along. And just because air traffic control is telling you to do something doesn't mean it's right. Or it could have been meant for someone else. I, I, we've been doing this sport now. Bill and I have been doing this, what, 20 years a pop? Um, yeah. And how many times do you hear air traffic control use the wrong call sign? Oh, you know, all oh, that lot. never happens. Plenty. That that <laughs> never happens at all. They are flawless controllers all the time. <laughs> now, just on a side note, and, and either of you, uh, feel free to to jump in here. When air traffic control, let's say your legacy flight one two three, and air traffic control says United flight one two three, uh, turn left heading five five whatever, uh, do you correct them or do you just Sit there with your arms crossed and wait for them to figure out what they did wrong. <laughs> I usually call them up and say, "Oh, was that for Legacy One Two Three?" I'll 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 do the arms crossed for the first one, and yeah. then I'll go I'll do what uh, Bill said and be like, "Oh, did you mean Legacy One Two Three? And they're like, "Oh yeah, 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 Legacy, Legacy." Yeah, yeah. Uh, I love it when I, I I do what Alex does. I'll fold my arms if I if I'm in a you know not in a hurry to get out of there or whatever, but I'll fold my arms. And I'll sit back in my seat, ready to cue the mic. And the captain goes, I think that was for us. I'm like, uh, no. And then they go, uh, United, one, two, three, turn left. Like, um, did you mean legacy one, two, three, turn left to zero, five, five? Whatever. <laughs> they roll their <laughs> eyes at me like, don't be such an asshole. <laughs> They're like, this guy's going into a hold for sure. Yeah. Uh, advise, ready to say, uh, repeat after me, cancel IFR and frequency to approve. <laughs> Squawk VFR. <laughs> So your, your aviation training, would you say it was a positive experience? Yeah. Yeah. I met a lot of great people there and, um, it was very disciplined, which helps with, uh, helps with what I'm doing now. Um, just, uh, keeping on the schedule and, uh, it's very disciplined with checklists and um, doing the same thing every day as far as keeping like SOPs, that sort of thing. Yeah. And I, I really do believe I got good training. Now, would I do it again and go to the same flight school, given the opportunity, especially in today's environment? No, I probably wouldn't. Um, like when, when people reach out to me and talk about you know, what school should I attend, um, I usually have kind of like a checklist, uh, forgive the expression, uh, I'd say, okay, well, who, who is interested? Is he or she, you know, what age are they? What's their background? And I usually tell them this, if they're, if they're young, they're in college, tell them, stay in college, get your degree, and find your local uh, GA airport that has a Cessna pilot training center, uh, enroll in the King Air, where you buy the CDs. I think now it's all online, but... You know, and you do, you pay as you go. You pay for, you do the lessons online and then you show up to the airport with the flight instructor. They print out your, your lesson plan and they follow the lesson plan. And you could have a different flight instructor every single leg and you'll still be on track to follow the lesson plan. Um, and I think it's the most economical way of doing it. Um, yeah, John and Martha King, if you're listening, I would love some sponsorship. Just send me an email <laughs> at aviatortony.com. You and I are about to do something that just a few years ago, people could only dream of. With me as your instructor, you're about to fly at the controls of your own personal airplane. This will be your first flying lesson. After you've taken your first flying lesson on video, we'll talk about how quickly you can learn to fly, how inexpensive it can be, and how simple the medical requirements are for being a pilot. I'll explain the career opportunities in flying, as well as how you can use an airplane for personal and business flying. And most important of all, we'll explain how you can get started flying today. Um, so uh, I think that's the best way to go because you're not, committing to a huge financial burden without knowing really what you're getting into. 
Because we all have these, you know, sparkle in our eye to go fly. You look up, you see your big airplanes, you're like, oh, one day it's going to be me. I mean, how many times have we had a guest on the show uh, say that, you know, they had the sparkle in their eye and finally they, you know, they, they persevered and, and they went to a flight school and here they are. Um, but I think you got to start with a baby step. If you can get your private pilot license, you complete it and you figure out financially you could afford it. The passion is there. The dedication is there. The hard work is something you're willing to put in. Then, yeah, I'd say go to like an ATP school because they're very streamlined. You know, they're not going to waste your time. Um, and they have these programs set in place to get you into a regional airline as soon as possible, regardless of the 1500 hour ATP minimums or traffic or air transport pilot minimums. That you have to have before you can even apply. So um, those flight schools are very lucrative. Now, the flight farms, like we've been talking about, like what Pan Am, former Pan Am used to be, uh, they were great, especially if you were a foreign student and you're here on a student visa. And they were, because like what you said, Bill, they're very structured. Every morning you get up, you go to the pre flight, you do your your pre-flight briefing, you go on an airplane, and it's a 141 school, meaning it's an FAR 141 program. They have set their own program, and the FAA has approved it, a lot like the airlines. The airline SOP manual is going to be different from each airline you go to or that you're employed with. So the United SOP is going to be slightly different than, say, the Delta SOP versus the American SOP. They're all going to do things differently, but they've all been approved by the FAA. And those SOPs are the FAA controlling regulations for those airlines. A Part 141 flight school is the same thing. It's not a Part 61 where you just, you know, follow a lesson plan. It's all, you show up, you do your thing. The 141 school is tailored for that school and that student. So things are a little different and you have to really do your homework if you're going to go to one of those schools. Now, Bill, you were a instructor at Pan Am. How did that transition go for you going from student to graduate to flight instructor? It was pretty seamless. Um, I had, they obviously hired me on right away and just put me in a pool and then said, when a student comes up, we'll give you a call. And within two weeks, I had my first student. Oh, pretty quick. Yeah, so yeah, pretty quick. And you never forget your first student <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh he was kind of a trouble child it, really? it kind of... I, I feel your pain <laughs> <laughs> oh we've we've opened pandora's box here ladies and gentlemen <laughs> <laughs> he, he was just one of those people that he kind of had a lot of attitude and he wasn't a team player kind of person and if there was a mistake made it wasn't his fault oh so, I, I, yeah. I had one of those right before i became a uh, like a uh, sandpiper pilot. Yeah, uh, it's it's a challenge. Yeah, you, know, you, you try to do your best to point them in the right direction, but you know it's hard to change someone's personality. Basically, yeah, it, it is, and that it c comes down to those principles of learning. You know, all flight instructors are handed a book sponsored by the FAA, the principles of learning, right? And because you're a teacher now. And if you don't have a teaching background, you've never probably read that book. And so you, you have to read it and you, you find out the different learning styles. And as a flight instructor, you really are moving your direction of your lesson plan according to the student. So what you did with the student you had at 8 a.m. is going to be different than the student you had maybe at 10 a.m. or noon. Mm -hmm. So th that is definitely a challenge for young flight instructors, especially with their first few students, is getting to know their learning styles and adjusting your teaching methods to, to accommodate that. Now, you said you had your first student who like, he never honed up to his own responsibility. It was never his fault, right? How do you, yeah. ch you said you can't really change personality, but you have to get past that barrier in order to have a successful lesson. How do you do that? It was a lot of, okay, yeah, it was where you'd say, well, this went wrong. And they would come up with 
a uh, the reason why it wasn't their fault. And then you'd have to say, well, but if you had done this, then this wouldn't have happened. And kind of gently and sometimes not so gently let them know, hey, you know, this was on you. And but this is what you can do next time to make it better. Is that usually received in a positive manner, do you think? Um, usually, yeah. It, for that person, it was definitely not a little bit of kid gloves kind of thing. Work better than being the hard nose, you're going to do it this way kind of guy. Yeah. You, you went from uh, being a student to being an instructor and getting work within a few weeks and you know yeah. really kind of diving into it um i did not have the same trajectory that you did and a lot of that has to do with the base or their their second campus uh, i guess you can call it the one at fort pierce that yeah. closed um it happened in 2005 uh the the Pan Am International Flight Academy announced uh, back then that it was closing its career pilot development training campus at Fort Pierce, Florida, and all the training equipment and aircraft would have been relocated to the Academy's CPD campus based in Phoenix, Arizona, which was at Deer Valley. This happened uh, after the devastation of two hurricanes. The latest was a strong hurricane that had a lot of destruction there in Fort Pierce area. So significant that insurance uh, adjusters said, that's enough, uh, we're not gonna insure you anymore uh, because the damage is just in the millions. So they decided to close the campus and send all the aircraft and flight instructors over to Deer Valley. Well, guess who was graduating from the academy right at that time was yours truly. And they had a big meeting. They called in all the students um, into the big conference room and they said, okay, here's what's going to happen. Uh, we told you when you signed on that we would hire you as long as, you know, you didn't have any major problems through your training. And, you know, usually within a few weeks, you would get a student and you know, you'd get one student, maybe two students. And then after a while with your seniority, uh, you'll get more students and you'll be working more and more. Well, they said, that's not going to happen. And uh, what we're going to do now is because we have to, you know, the, the, the instructors and the aircraft are coming, but the students really are not going to relocate from Florida to Phoenix. So they're not gonna, we're not going to have jobs for you. And we suggest you go work at Home Depot for like six months until we call you. And here's how it's going to work. I can remember the, the chief pilot looking around the room going, how many of you have had like zero pink slips and have finished ahead of schedule? And a dozen hands were raised and go, okay, you guys are the first ones we're going to call. And how many of you have finished on time or no pink slips on time? And more hands went up. And okay, we're going to call you second. And those that finished a little bit, you know, maybe 10 hours more than projected. Okay, we're going to call you third. How many have had one pink slip? Okay, we'll call you fourth. <laughs> so uh, pink slip being a, a check ride failure. Um, and so I'm sitting there going, well, this sucks. You know, I, I signed on the right. dotted line, gave you close to $100,000 for my education expenses. And now you're telling me you're not going to hire me as promised. I mean, what I should have done is consulted your wife and hired an attorney. <laughs> But I ended up at a flight school in the Chandler area, and it actually worked out better for me because I was you know, soon promoted to the assistant chief, and it gave me an opportunity to learn a lot about the operating of flight school. Um, and it was a huge, uh, I think, boost to my knowledge of general aviation, and not just staying in that bubble. Uh, you were fortunate enough to stay and continue flying, and you had your students. How was that training afterwards when that happened? Did, your, did you now have to compete with other flight instructors to get students? Did work actually slow down for you? The funny thing, so I was pretty good friends with the chief pilot at that time. And he said, when uh, all these students come over, part of the students that are coming over are from the KLM program. Mm -hmm. And there's an opportunity for a couple more instructors. In that program, it's um, 
has a salary, 401k, health insurance. Uh, you have to go over to the Netherlands and uh, do some flight training and get your JA certificate uh, equivalent oh, wow. so that you could teach the students over here. Mm -hmm. Would you like to do that? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so I jumped on that and got to go over to the Netherlands for about two months and fly over there and with the, uh, is the Martin Air Flight Academy. Mm -hmm. um, got the JAL or the equivalency so that I could teach European students in the United States. And uh, yeah, that was a great experience. Um, all the students from the KLM, most of them were uh, kind of legacies. You know, their parents were worked for KLM and uh, they were all, you know, very well vetted, very smart people and uh, really, really motivated. So uh, it was pretty easy transitioning over with them because they were, you know, most of the people going to Pan Am were very motivated and smart as well. But, uh, you know, they had taken, the KLM students had taken like the really crazy hard written where you're like navigating by the stars and all that real old school kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they had to live up to their family expectations. So, um, so yeah, it was a, a good experience. Uh, a lot of fun having, hanging out in the Netherlands and um, met a lot of cool people. And, and then what, they'd call me up. They'd call me up and, oh, I have a job now with KLM and I'm going to be the second officer in the 747. Yeah, interesting you yeah. say that. Second officer. That's something that's foreign to the U.S. Uh, airlines. What is a second officer? I'm under the impression it's basically like a FB. Uh, you know, you, you make the bunk, you do your time uh, monitoring the aircraft when you're in cruise, and then uh, watch the landing. <laughs> watch it. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then you go into the simulator every couple of months and get current on landings. Yeah. And, and I remember when I was at Pan Am, they had a huge uh, a Chinese program. So Chinese students would come over. They would come in with, I think, their private already. Uh, yeah. And, and then they would do the conversion and they'd start from instrument on. And they, I think they could fail two events. If they failed two events, that's it. You go back. And if you go back, you go back with shame that you couldn't, you know, finish. And these guys were like really motivated. And the, the flight school actually put them up in, I think they would have like a little apartment where they would share with four people. So, yeah, you know, that sounds familiar. And they couldn't, it didn't really didn't have two pennies to, to rub together. So I know a lot of their flight instructors like would once a week would take them all out to dinner because <laughs> you'd see them in the round of flight school and they're like sucking on ketchup packets that they got from McDonald's and you're like, what, what are you doing? And they're like, oh yeah, it's good. It's a good snack. You know, <laughs> you're like, wait, what? Can't you just get a sandwich? And like, oh no, too expensive. <laughs> so yeah, the, there, there are plenty of international programs out there. Um, these flight, these big flight schools, you know, they, they make a lot of money with them. It's amazing that you got to go and be a part of that. I didn't know that. What's it like to convert from your FAA instructor licenses over to, to JAL licenses? It is that a big yeah. process? Um, basically, not really. You've already done this stuff. Um, there was a few more going into greater details on a couple of things. Like they really started going into. Uh, you know, doing the calculus on how much lift a wing is going to have, that sort of thing. <laughs> so that, that got Ugh. a little crazy. But the basic flight instruction part of it, the stuff that really matters was the same. Yeah. I heard they make you really dive in and explain the weather prog charts and all the yeah. different like altitudes and the pressure gradient stuff and explain, what are we looking at here? And you're like, uh, it's Latin to me. <laughs> right. <laughs> It looks good. <laughs> yeah. A lot of it was just, I feel like, stuff that they used to teach way back when. And, but in real life, especially nowadays, you, you barely even use that kind of thing. It's, you know, you pull out your WSI or whatever kind of weather uh, 
whether app you use for your company and right. get it from there. You, know? you look at the pictures and you go, oh, red, bad, green, good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, as we uh, were talking about earlier about how I went to be a flight instructor and Chandler and you stayed at Pan Am, in that time, you know, I got married and ended up having a child. And in uh, February of 2006, we had had our first child, our baby, our daughter. And I remember right around that time, I was the stay-at-home dad Monday through Friday. And after some time off, my wife went back to work for a little while because I was a flight instructor. And I really couldn't afford to be comfortable on a flight instructor salary. There just weren't enough students for me at a small flight school in Chandler, the Tailwind Flight Academy, as it was once called. Um, so we decided she'd go back to work for a little while, we kept our health benefits and things like that until I got a job with an airline. And I remember uh, Roger and I, our own Captain Roger, uh, we went down to uh, Denver to interview for a uh, regional carrier that is known as SkyWest. And we went there, interviewed, and we were sitting on pins and needles for about a week. And then we both got these letters in the mail saying, thank you so much for coming in for your interview. We'd like to invite you to try back again in six months. At this time, you were not selected. And we thought, oh, crap. And after I got that letter, I came down to Pan Am. One day I was with my daughter. I had her in the car seat, came down, just came down to, to just see friends and, and see what's going on and try to get a beat on this because I was like, Can I, I need to get a job. Maybe someone there at Pan Am that I know, maybe a former flight instructor or something, has like their resumes out somewhere. Maybe they can give me some advice. And I walked in and the, I believe she was an assistant chief at the time, which one of my, uh, my CFII flight instructor, Andrea, um, and we sat down in her office and then you came walking in <laughs> and it's like, Bill, what's going on? And so the three of us sat down and we were talking about putting out resumes and we actually had plans to get together, uh, a day or two later. And, you know, I introduced, you know, my, my newborn to everyone. And it, it was just a really positive experience for me that day. And then I remember, you know, going home and the next day you had called me and you, you said something that I, kind of threw me aback. You said, Hey, did you hear about Andrea? And I was like, no, no, uh, we're, or, or she want to go to lunch today or what's going on? And you said, no, she's she passed away. She's no longer with us. She, she had an airplane crash. And I thought you were joking around. I honestly could not fathom knowing someone who had been a part of an accident like that. And you're like, no, I'm serious. Uh, she, she was doing spin training with a, with a student and they, we don't know much, but she did, she crashed. Um, what do you remember of that day? Um, just the shock, you know, and course everybody starts speculating what happened but you know it she was a close friend and shock and sadness how could that happen what happened yeah yeah and i think if you're in the industry long enough you will know someone personal to you that will lose their life um i had a captain who i flew with many times over at Sandpiper when I was based in Los Angeles. Um, flew with him. Uh, he was a very particular gentleman, uh, very, very stringent in his SOP, very smart guy. And he did a lot of flying as a hobby in his spare time with his friends, flying vintage aircraft all over the country. Uh, he was one of the only pilots that had the training certification or the sign off to fly what they called the flying duck. Um, and he would show me these museum piece aircraft you know, where some of them, there were only one or two in existence in the world. And he was flying them on a regular basis. And he would often fly for the Chino air show. He would fly for the Reno air races um, as a pilot for his friends that would sponsor the flying. Um, and unfortunately, a few years ago, uh, I was very saddened to hear that he was a legacy airline pilot uh, who was practicing for an air show in Chino a few years back, and he was flying the flying wing 
uh, and Alex, I don't know if you, you heard this story, but, uh, the, he lost control of the aircraft for some reason. I can only assume it was a malfunction. Um, and he crashed and did not make it. Um, so it doesn't matter if you're a GA pilot, a flight instructor, an airline captain, uh, these incidences will happen and you will hear about someone, you know, um, if you're in the industry long enough, you'll definitely know someone. Alex, yeah. have you heard of anyone? Do any of your friends? I actually had a similar story to what you guys had happen. Um, one of my, uh, he was a few classes behind me at um, the flight school that I used to attend. And uh, I was reading an article one day or something like that, or someone posted on Facebook. I don't remember, but um, he was out doing spin training out over the hills in uh, El Cajon area. And uh, it was with a very experienced instructor and they both put it down into the mountainside. So that's the only one that I've really had um, that I know personally that has had that happen. But yeah, you're right. It, sooner or later, you're going to know somebody that that crashes. And it's, it's a sad reality of the world we live in. Yeah. Now, now, Bill, you said you knew her personally, obviously, uh, you were coworkers and friends, and uh, we all have this, uh, you know, connection together. What, what was it about that event? It's not the first event that Pan Am had experienced, as we've discussed earlier, where there was uh, an accident with loss of life. But what was it about that event that hit you the way it did? Well, uh, just mainly the fact that it was a close friend. And, you know, in the earlier event, there were no instructors on the plane. You know, she was an instructor. And there didn't seem to be any sort of mechanical issue or anything. So it came down to seeming like it was just somehow lost control in the plane. Yeah. And, you know, how can you prevent that? Yeah. Um, you can't. Well, we're going to talk about the dangers of spin training and the dangers that flight instructors find themselves in when they're flying with a student that might do something that jeopardizes the safety of the flight. We're going we're gonna to discuss that and more about Bill's journey right after the break. Captain Mills welcomes the passengers aboard. Today we're going to fly at an altitude of 28,000 feet. Our flying time will be just under six hours. Captain Mills, his first officer, and the flight engineer sit in the cockpit of the plane. The cockpit contains hundreds of instruments. These instruments help the pilot fly safely in the busy air lanes. Right now, the captain is setting one of the radio dials. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from the break. Well, we've been speaking with Bill and uh, Alex about his bill's journey in aviation uh some of the pros and cons with uh, attending and instructing at a large flight school uh, we've also spoke of right before the break uh, a mutual friend that we shared and lost tragically in uh, june of 2006 to a pretty major accident that caused uh, two individuals to lose their life now, later on in the show, we will speak a little bit more about this, but I wanted to continue a little bit more with the journey of Bill M. and his career and how he ended up at the legacy carrier that we affectionately called Legacy Airlines here on the show. Now, your, your transition time from flight instructing to the time you first started looking into the regional airline, how many years went by? Um, well, I had, uh, I have a similar letter from, uh, Sky West where I was rejected. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was probably somewhere in 2005, 2006 ish, maybe even a little bit earlier than that. 
Um, I was also put in the hiring pool for Chicago Express, and uh, oh. they just disappeared. <laughs> At, at that point, you know, I'm waiting for my call and yeah. also I see the news that they no longer exist. Yeah. And after that was when I went and did the KLM thing. Mm -hmm. um, there was a two year commitment on that. But um, I think they had it was a year, maybe a year and a half at Pan Am and then KLM left Pan Am and went with Sabina. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going with them. Um, and uh, taught over there for a while, and then that then moved over to Falcon Field, mm -hmm. um, and I taught there for a little while as well. And then uh, one of my former students called me up and was like, "You know, you really need to get into the regionals. I think you should come over to uh, Sandpiper." Hmm. That's a so. that's a pretty uh, considerate former student. Who who is this former student <laughs> you're talking about? Uh, you know, at the time he was a guy, I think he went by Anthony at the time. Oh, okay. A Aviator Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you ended up applying and how did that process work? Did, was it a pretty quick turnaround? Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty quick. Um, I want to say within a couple of days I had, I knew that they were, um, going to take me and I, I think it was less than two weeks and I, I told them that I needed two weeks to to give to my company that I was working for and uh like pretty much like oh well we've been opening now at this point and I kind of just jumped on it then mm -hmm. um it was I, probably within two three weeks of when I first did the uh, interview yeah and so, what was your yeah. total time when you first applied at uh Sandpiper <laughs> Um, I want to say it was around uh, around two thousand, two thousand two hundred ish, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay, and how many years did it take? So from two thousand and one to two thousand and seven. Yeah, about six years. So, yeah, six years. Yeah, so about mm -hmm. five years of instruction. Yeah. That's yeah, terrible. I mean, that's a long time. It's not like mm -hmm. at a flight school, Listen. especially where you're doing two or three hops a day, right? Right. It wasn't ten months and. Zero to hero. Oh, it wasn't. It wasn't what they promised you. Is that what you're telling me? No. Wait. No. Come on. Wait. <laughs> no. There were circumstances, of course, but yeah. but yeah, it definitely uh, was not as promised. Now, do you hold any Ill, Ill will or uh, a grudge against this uh, former student who called you and told you to apply <laughs> as a sandpiper? <laughs> no, absolutely not. I'm, I'm in a great place right now. <laughs> good, good. You know, um, it, was, it was something that, you know, I've said it before. And for those new listeners out there, you may not have heard this, but... Uh, anyone that's been following the podcast for any length of time has heard me say that as a professional pilot, we stand on the shoulders of all of those who came before us. Alex has heard this, you know, too many times, I think. I've heard all your shows. Yeah. All, all <laughs> 121 of them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, and we really do. And it's important that when you become that aviator, Really, you gotta take care of each other. You've gotta, you know, reach down as you reach that next step, that next tier, and say, "Who can I bring with me?" You know, who who was it that helped me that I can now in turn help them? Um, it was a privilege and an honor to to reach out to you, send you that email that day, and say, "Hey, man, um, I, I've sent out quite a few of those in my career, uh, saying, hey, here's an opportunity. I think this could benefit you.'" Um, and when it works out, it is one of the most gratifying, uh, feelings and experiences. Um, so thank you for, you know, allowing me and giving me the credit, <laughs> which I don't know if I deserve <laughs> it, but uh, thank you for, for, you know, heeding my advice and coming on. It was a really felt good to see you on campus there at the Chicago O'Hare International Airport a few times we've crossed paths uh yeah. know, between flights and and it's always so cool it's just a small world this aviation industry it really really is yeah it's crazy it's um yeah you bring in people all the time it's like hey i just ran into a 
a Pan Am CFI the other day in Chicago waiting to go to the hotel. Oh, wow. I don't know if you remember. I can't remember his last name right now, but Courtney. Um, oh, yeah. I remember the name. I can't picture him. Yeah. But uh, like, hey, how you doing? You know, that happens like all the time. Yeah. And I have, a, you know, a group of uh, people that, you know, we have the group text going on and, you know, hey, congratulations on making a captain. And even if you're having to go to New York or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That you know, and, and it's funny. You said that when you first got on to the Sandpiper, uh, you were on an aircraft called a Saab 340. I thought they stopped making Saabs, right? Or is that a car? <laughs> no, it's <laughs> turboprop. I don't know if you remember those. Uh, turboprop. Oh, is that a per- yeah, they, oh, neat. That's those mild. propeller things. Turbo, the, the meat the, grinder. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, the meat grinder. Yes. I'm deathly afraid. I've, I've said this before. I'm deathly afraid of turboprops because uh, <laughs> we had a mutual uh, student from Pan Am, Curtis, Jay, if you're listening. Ooh, yeah. Um, yeah. Who used to send me autopsy photos of, <laughs> of rampers. <laughs> that oh, walk through turbo and i'm like stop sending me this stuff i go to open it and i'm like he goes isn't this shocking it'll give you a respect for <laughs> propellers i'm like don't don't send me any more autopsy photos please you know what if <laughs> what if my wife or daughter open it you know at the time i was <laughs> yeah um so yeah I, i'm definitely afraid of those spinning whirly meat grinders <laughs> I've, I've been scarred so you were on that airplane how was i during my initial, I remember you had a choice, ATR, Saab, Embraer 145, CRJ. And the Embraer yeah. 145 and the CRJ went super senior every time. And the Saab and the ATR were kind of more the junior aircraft because people wanted their jet time. They didn't want their turboprop time, right? And I was told that the Saab was probably the hardest airplane to learn in ground school because it was one of the more, let's just say, analog aircraft that we had. Yeah. Would you would you agree with that statement? Oh yeah, it was definitely the hardest ground school I went through. Um, yeah, and some of it was that I think they they just went into such detail on some things where like, oh, this sensor goes off between this temperature and that temperature, and you're just sitting there in class going, how uh-huh. is that ever going to help me in the plane? Yeah, uh-huh. 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 yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> what's the uh, serial that... number and the tensillary weight on the uh, number five screw that's on the uh, wing <laughs> strut? Right. <laughs> Is that a yellow light or an amber light? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. You haven't studied. See? You need to study. <laughs> yeah, I remember And uh, the V1 cuts on those. Awful, awful, man. You had to be in the gym for like a month just to get through those yeah <laughs> yeah right rudder right rudder. Yeah, you'd, <laughs> right <laughs> you'd, you'd be walking out of the sim and just shaking <laughs> yeah i remember actually I remember on the even on the embryer because you know you don't you don't realize that you need to freaking trim that crap right and if you right. if you're afraid to trim it because you're not used to it, and you just go trim, trim, trim. Okay, I trimmed it. No, and the instructor would reach down, hold the trim uh, knob for like ten seconds. One, two, three. I want you to count. Count with me. Four, five. Okay. And I'm like, oh wow, there's no pressure on my leg anymore. <laughs> Was it on the Ember though? You could only hold it for a couple seconds, and you just stop and do it again. Yeah, and if you did it, if you held it for I think more than three or five seconds. Like- yeah. Then and then it would think that there was a fault in the switch and it would cut out and then you'd have to go back to neutral and then hold it again. But if you did it for more than like 10 seconds, it would completely cut out the switch altogether and then you're screwed. Seven. Right. Seven seconds? Seven seconds. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, not that I was paying attention in ground school or anything. <laughs> <laughs> See? Well, details matter. <laughs> Now that's going to push out some other information that I know about the Airbus. Jeez. <laughs> See, law of privacy, man. Well, the Airbus information from the Airbus must be pretty clouded because not only did you fly the Saab 340, you flew some other aircraft as well for Sandpiper. Now, how long were you on the Saab? I was only on it for about a year. Is that and, a DFW uh, there? No, it was in uh, L.A. at the time. Oh, it was L.A. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was when – it was around 2008, and they were – I guess it was another downturn going on and uh, they were getting rid of the Saab in LA and uh, they were also talking about furloughs at that time. Yes. And 
Yeah, and they're offering uh, leave of absence for up to five years. You get to keep your seniority. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, at that point, we just had our second child. Oh, boy. And we're living in Phoenix. And um, I was like, okay, well, at that time, second year, FO, regional pay versus the cost of two kids in child care. My wife makes a good good salary. So I ended up uh, taking that leave of absence for two years and being a stay-at-home dad. Yeah. So you took a two-year LOA leave of absence. And were you going to be on that list regardless if you took it I, or not? Uh, no. No. And I don't know if they ever did end up furloughing anybody. but I think they did um, uh, four or five they, people. It was a very yeah. small number. I, I, and I only know because one of the first officers that I f- flew it, or no, it was a new hire that I was mentoring because I was a pilot mentor for the union. Um, he ended up getting furloughed for like, I don't know what it was, like 90 days. Hmm. It was pretty, it was it. pretty short. Yeah, it was pretty, it was a big deal. Everybody was nervous. They, they, they had enough people take a leave of absence to where these, and, and they were bad. I mean, these, I mean, anytime you're a new hire and they're like, Hey, congratulations, you're on the line. You're type rated. Here's your line. You're on reserve. Awesome. By the way, uh, you're going to get furloughed next week. It's like, why? why? You know, so these people are like, hey, I just made a huge move, huge financial sacrifice to come work here. And now you're going to furlough me. Um, so it was a big deal. And, uh, but enough people with seniority took leave of absences that they only had to furlough a few. That's, that's not terrible then, but I mean, still. Yeah. But- now, what did you do in those two years where you stayed home dad? Stay at home dad. Yep. Yeah. Now you had went, a, a two year old and a baby. <laughs> yeah. Now, and, and it's, I, I got to say, one of the most positive times in my lifetime was that time frame where I got to be a stay at home dad on during the week. On the weekends, I still flew. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a time you'll never get back. If you have that opportunity to make that decision, obviously, we all have to make our own choices on our path and our aviation careers and our journeys in life. But that time it has more value than you would think. Um, and it's a bonding time that you, if given that opportunity, I would take it hands down. Now in that two year time frame, uh, so they, they had an economic downturn. They removed the sob from the Los Angeles international base. They, they actually parked all the sobs sold them, did whatever they did with them. They moved the location of the terminal in Los Angeles from the west side near the maintenance hangar to the east side of the airport uh, in a brand new uh, regional commuter terminal. Um, At that time, they also transitioned from the Saab to the Embraer 145. It was actually the Embraer 140, but um, the 140 became a base. I was in Chicago at the time and I saw, oh my God, LA is opening a base on my aircraft. So I bid it and got it. So you were walking out the door and I was <laughs> walking in. Um, and so I spent about two and a half, three years there in Los Angeles. And we were talking about furloughs and things like that. Well, then what happened, uh, I want to say around 2013 or 2012 was a bankruptcy was announced for the main line partner, um, the owner of the, you know, the, the legacy partner. And they ended up eventually closing the base entirely. And that's how I ended up back in Chicago. By then you were coming back. I think I had upgraded in 2014 or 15. And I got, I took the first captain upgrade I could take on that aircraft, which was New York, a JFK LaGuardia co-domicile. And around that time, you came back to the line. And when you came back, you came back on the 145? Yeah, yep, but based in Dallas. Based in Dallas. And how long were you on the 145? Yeah, I had about, I think it was about 2010 when I came back to to the line. And I was about, yeah, two years. Yeah. So you came back 2010 before the bankruptcy? Four years, yeah. 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 So I was in Dallas at the time on the 145. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I did the same thing, jumped on the first uh, captain seat that I could get because that's how things went back then. If you wanted to yeah. wanted to move up, I ended up on the CRJ in uh, 
New York as well. Yeah. So I had the the new plane, new seat, new domicile that I'd never been to. Now the CRJ was that a JFK primarily aircraft, or was that primarily in LaGuardia? It was both. Oh, it was both. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and now that was what year? Uh, that's been 2014. 2014. So yeah, I think you and I yeah. were were pretty close to each other. Were we there at the same time? Do you remember? I think you had already moved to Chicago by the time I got there. Okay. I, don't, I don't think we ever met up in New York at all. Yeah, I don't remember that. I remember being the second from the bottom on the Embraer <laughs> in New York, having a crash pad in Jamaica, Queens, New York, uh, um, oh. in, in what's famously called Q Gardens, K E W Gardens. Yes. Um, Q Gardens is, as a crow flies, the midpoint between JFK and LaGuardia. Um, it is also known as Delta Gardens because a lot of Delta flight crews, flight attendants, and pilots alike have crash pads in Q Gardens. As a matter of fact, you can't throw a rock and not hit a crash pad in Q Gardens. Uh, it was centrally located. There was plenty of transportation, subway systems, buses. They even had a uh, shuttle service from Kew Gardens in both directions. You could, for six bucks at the time, I'm sure it's much more expensive now, but for $6, yeah. you could you know, show up at the scheduled time. You'd jump in the back of a minivan with a bunch of other crew members at, oh, dark 500 hours, whatever, and you would go, where are you going? LaGuardia. Okay, this van's going to LaGuardia. Where are you going? JFK. Okay, this van's going to JFK. And they had a Newark van, too. Um, so you could do that. You could take public transportation. You could take a cab. You could take an Uber, although Uber was kind of new back then um, and much more expensive than, than you would think. So, yeah, it was definitely an experience. Um, I could do a whole show just on Q Gardens, <laughs> yeah. a, a.k.a. I, I spent Gardens. my time there, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was fun uh, that time. But I was a second from the bottom. And I knew the, the most junior captain. And he had a crash pad right across the street from LaGuardia. So I knew that every time he would bid, he would bid out of LaGuardia. Now, when you're at the bottom at Sandpiper they actually have what's called airport standby. So mm -hmm. it's, it's below mm -hmm. short call. It's actually, you're physically at the airport for eight hours on an eight hour shift within a reasonable time to the gate. Usually they say 15 minutes. So that in case there's a misconnect or something, they can call you up. You should be in the ready room or the sleep room and they should call you up and say, okay, got a flight for you. You're flying Raleigh, whatever. And so you would, you know, just walk up to the gate, ready to go. And uh, I knew he was in LaGuardia and he was going to bid LaGuardia ready because that's what his seniority would hold. So I always bid JFK ready so that I could bid the 6 a.m. ready because I knew there was no traffic. I'd be up really early and all I would do is go into the sleep room in, in JFK, throw a blanket over my head, put the phone on my chest on loud and fall asleep. And if the phone yeah. woke me up, that was crew scheduling, which happened maybe 10% of the time. The rest of the time, by noon, I'd call them and go, hey, man, it's kind of slow. Your, your next ready crew is already here. You're going to release me? They're like, you're released. Go. And I'd go back to the crash pad in Kew Gardens, and I'd go for a run and grab some Chinese food or halal meat or <laughs> whatever vendor was out front. And that was my day. Um, did you experience the same kind of lack of flying in JFK on the CRJ, or was your schedule more plentiful? I do uh, remember having lots of times as airport standby and being crashed out in the uh, in the crew room. Um, I would often uh, come in on a FedEx flight that night oh, wow. and then just go to sleep when I got to the uh, to either my crash pad or to the um, to the crew room. And where were you at the time? And, were you in uh, Phoenix or? No, I was in uh, where I live now in Central Texas. So I was flying oh, okay. out of the Austin Airport. Oh, okay. So, but the the options for getting to New York, there weren't a lot of them. Not from even Austin, yeah. If you, yeah, even going up to Dallas, but Dallas is like a two hour drive for me, and Austin was an hour, so yeah. just made a lot more sense. And I got to going off on FedEx. I could sleep in the back there, sleep in their hub for a little bit, and then sleep on the way to New York. Now, a and lot just of kind of maximize family time. Yeah. A lot of pilots don't realize that uh, with we have what's called a jump seat agreement. You know, uh, when you're an airline pilot, I, I'm asked this quite often. It's like, how do you live in Los Angeles and 
work out of, let's say, Chicago, which I did for many years. Um, do they? They always ask you, do they buy you a, an airplane ticket? I'm like, no. <laughs> uh, we we have we are responsible for getting ourselves there. And they're like, do you have to pay? And I'm like, well, no. We can ride as long as there's an open seat. We have to list on whatever airline standby list there is, and we fly lowest level standby, meaning all the passengers that are in standby go ahead of us before we get to get an open seat. Sometimes mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. And as a pilot, we have an agreement with most airlines where we can sit in the pilot's jump seat in the cockpit as long as we satisfy all the security requirements, we have all the documentation. Nine out of 10, it's better that you're in uniform. You don't have to be in uniform, but if you're wearing jeans and a t-shirt, the odds are the captain's not gonna let you up there. It's business casual minimum if you're in civvies and you, we get to go to work. But if you're commuting in the day of a trip and you're going across the country, how ready to fly are you going to be? Are you, you know, tired? Are you rested? You know, uh, do you, did you get the proper food and everything else that you needed for the day so that you can be prepared to go fly? Big questions. Now, a lot of people, they run out of options sometimes and they're forced to look at other options like flying on a cargo aircraft. And a lot of listeners out there are thinking, well, wait, how do you, how do you do that? So if you don't mind, if you could, Tell us, how do you do that? They had a, uh, the FedEx at least had a website that you would go to and put yourself on the list and then give them a call. And if you were the first person for that or the first, within the first four people, I think the, most of the planes had four seats, mm -hmm. then you automatically got the seat. However, if you did that, it didn't show up, then you would get blacklisted and they wouldn't they wouldn't accept you on there anymore. Oh. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's fairly simple, not much different than jump seating on a legacy or yeah, any other airline. Yeah. Yeah. And now is it like the movie, uh, was it Castaway, where you're in the cargo compartment on a, on a seat or is it in the cockpit? Um, it depended on the plane. There were some in the, in the uh, cockpit, but there's usually a, uh, a section between the cockpit and the cargo area that had four like first class seats. At least on, I I did it a lot on the uh, MD eleven. MD eleven. So uh, yeah, they'd have four seats there. And, yeah. Well, thank you for for sharing that uh, with us. I mean, I've never had the opportunity uh, to ride on a as a commute on a. Cargo company. I know Ontario has a lot of people do that when they're trying to get to work uh, commuting, um, and they'll yeah. just go over to that side of the airport to their operations. And I was told that it's always a very positive experience. They even ask you what kind of meal you want on a lot of these longer flights, and you're like, "Really? I'm a freeloader, and you're right. ready to give me a meal?" I'm like, "Sweet." And it's like, "Well, what, when does a flight attendant bring that meal up?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you become the flight attendant. You, yeah, then, then you become the flight attendant, right? As the jump seat, like, hey, why don't you go get us our meals? You know, make sure you heat them up in the, <laughs> in the <Right>. oven. <laughs> oh, yes, sir. Okay. I've only had don't one bad it. experience commuting, and that was actually just recently. Yeah, and uh, out of Ontario? Uh, no, I actually had to go out of John Wayne. And they couldn't take me because they were weight restricted going into Chicago. They needed the extra gas because the snowstorm first snowstorm of the season was hitting oh they had the alternate and fuel so, and all that yeah what yeah, what airplane so was they it they had to seven three uh on us mm -hmm. have you had the experience on another airline yet nope it's been pretty easy getting in and out of ontario to go to uh dallas what i would suggest here. you do um, um on a day where the weather's good and everything is is looking good go to work a little earlier and Go through the process with Southwest. Since you do that, I don't know if they go directly into DFW from Ontario. No, they, go, they go to Love. They go to Love Field? Oh. Yeah. I was going to say, try, try jump sending on another airline at least once um, so that you have that experience and you know what to do. Because every airline out there when you're commuting is a little different. I know Alaska had a process that was a little different than United's process, that was a little different than Southwest's process. I mean, in my time, I've pretty much been on every 
uh, commercial carrier, uh, airline carrier, to to try to get a ride home uh, from Horizon yep. to you know Great Lakes. I mean, I've, I've pretty much done them all um, in my time. And every you know, some of them you just show up, you show your your ID and your your pilot's license and your medical. Some of them want a passport. Some of them don't care. Um, some are pretty lax about it. Others are like, you know, blow into this tube, give me a vial of your blood, uh, go and ask the captain, make sure you bow and beg for them <laughs> for the jump seat and, uh, <laughs> and make sure you never turn your back on the captain. And <laughs> there's, there's all different types. There's, we, we have a show actually uh, towards the beginning of this podcast adventure that talks about jump seat etiquette. Um, it's pretty important. Um, I'm still kind of shocked to this day. Uh, that people will just show up and go, I'm in the back. You're like, I'm sorry, who are you? Yeah. Right. Well, I fly for, you know. Or if they show up at all. ABC airline. I'm in the back. Like, you are? Yeah. Oh, do, do you want to see my stuff? <laughs> I mean, we, yeah. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. And gen I generally, if I'm on there, like, if I'm in the back, I'll, I'll stop up front on my way in and I'll be like, hey, Captain, I uh, just wanted to let you know, I, they gave me a seat in the back. Is that okay if I ride in the back? As a commuter, now, I'll tell you this. Uh, if you're on your own metal, uh, you're not required to do that. And they don't really expect you to do that either because you're on your own metal. I mean, they can, well, they can it, see your name right there on the list if they want to look I, it up. I was going to say... I was going to say, leg Legacy and Sandpiper, would that be considered own metal? Yes. Ish. Yeah, no, no. Your, your paycheck is signed by the same person who signs my paycheck. That's your own metal. Oh, okay. Now, as a courtesy, it is a sign of good manners to always at least poke your head in and go, hey, I'm, I'm with, you know, someone Some Sandpiper, own, so. and I'm, I'm commuting to work. I'm in the back if you need anything. Okay. Thanks for the ride. That always, I, I mean, I love when they take the time to do that. Now, sometimes we're busy, but most yeah. of the time we're busy, you know, programming an FMS or, you know, getting a clearance or something. But for the most part, uh, it's always appreciated. Now, if you're on someone else's metal, it doesn't matter if you're in the back, you're in the cockpit, it doesn't matter. You're on somebody else's metal. You should always present yourself onto the flight deck with your credentials in your hand, nine out of 10. The captain will be like, I don't need to see that. You know, you got your ticket. Enjoy the ride. You know, lucky, lucky, or uh, they'll say glad to return the favor because they're a commuter too, you know? Mm -hmm. But when you show up and you're like, yeah, I'm in the back. And like, well, do you have your pilot license? Right? Oh, it's in my bag. Hold on. Let me get, you know, you're not ready. You know, um, it's just a courtesy. That's all it is. Yeah. And a please yeah. and thank you goes along the way. A long way. Exactly. Yeah. I'm so-and-so from this airline. Right. I mean, the captain's okay job is I, to know yeah. every, everything that's going on on the aircraft. They're the captain, right? And if they don't know that you're back, what if there's a, a problem and they need help and they can go, hey, that get that jump seater up here. You know, you can save the day. Be a hero. <laughs> kind of like in the movie Snakes on a Plane. Yeah, I played on PlayStation. <laughs> yeah, I got 1,500 hours <laughs> logged, logged on the PlayStation. On the, play, on the station of play. Um <laughs> Bill, your transition to legacy, how, how did that go? You're, so here you are, CRJ captain, you're living the dream, you're making your, your donuts, you actually can pay the rent and the mortgage, you know, all that on time. And you get the email or the call saying, congratulations, your next class date is on said date. Uh, how did that, how was that? Was that just kind of like, oh, cool, or was it a big deal? It was a big deal, and uh, it was kind of a lot of, okay, I got, there's a couple little hoops here and there to to go through, like with the 401k and stuff like that. And it's just like, well, I just got to make sure I do this all right and don't mess anything up. But yeah, it was a big day. Definitely. Very exciting. Yeah. And let's compare for a moment, the training you received at Sandpiper and then what, 15 years <laughs> later, the training you received <laughs> at Legacy. What was the difference there? So much more relaxed, and uh, you didn't feel like at at Legacy. They're like, "Okay, I see you came from Sandpiper. Forget everything about that. Get over your PTSD from that." And he's <laughs> like, "We want you to pass. We're going to do everything we can to to work with you and get you through this." And yeah, and yeah, they were great. It was 
just night and day as far as pressure and feeling like they were on your side and on your team and you're all yeah on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to agree. Same experience for me. I mean, and at that point, I think when you're flying, you know, you got hired, you went through the vetting process and they know you can fly. Okay. And especially when they look at your background they go, okay, you have two, you know, a decade and a half flying for a, an airline, eh, you know? So they're not sitting here grilling you like, oh, you got to study, you know, because you know this already. You, you don't come with a, an un, not understanding that you need to be prepared like you might at your first airline job. So there's a difference in the style in your training. And I think that's a little bit of that is normal. And I think more so is that we live in a different time. And as yeah. technology, as education, as the policies and, and the really perspective of what's expected of you changes, I think now uh, we see that it's a kinder, gentler training course. Um, and I know I've spoken with Alex quite a bit about the training he received at Sandpiper recently compared that to the training that that you and I, Bill, got at Sandpiper back in the day. And even that, when you're comparing apples to apples, is a lot different. You know, they're no mm. longer asking you what the, you know, the temperature range for the start cycle on the SOP 340 is anymore for that particular valve they don't care can you fly well, the airplane and can you make good judgment that's i mean don't do me wrong they do care you still have to go through they're not doing a grilling oral anymore you still have to know the information to pass a, a knowledge test but it's not like they're like you see this bolt right here what does this bolt hold on right right they're not doing that anymore yeah what's the composite uh uh of the uh fan blades on the <laughs> engine down your aircraft what yeah what's the material that's made out of what <laughs> what percentage of aluminum is in the fan blades <laughs> yeah what's the biggest size uh that you have to report to maintenance and if you find an anomaly in the leading edge of one of the fan blades, like what <laughs> so let's <laughs> we're having too much fun about talking shit about training let's let's move forward a couple questions before we move on to some of the topics we wanted to explore on today's show bill what do you think uh is one of the biggest factors you wish you knew when you were first starting this career that would have made things just so much more better um i guess uh financing and uh not taking out such a huge loan for that uh where I was, it was probably the right way to go. But as you spoke to earlier, said for a lot of people, it's a good idea to do the private and the instrument at an FBO kind of thing, or at a school that isn't going to, you know, where you're not taking out a huge loan. Right. Um, I'm I'm still paying mine. I heard you uh, have paid yours off. So congratulations. Yeah, I did a. You know, I've had many issues over the years, uh, and just to clarify the the method I've used to pay it off. Um, so, you know, you get this giant loan uh, from, at the time, was KeyBank, right? Mm -hmm. And then KeyBank sells the loan like four or five times and you're paying it off and then you go through, you know, downturns and leave of absences and, and furloughs and things. And sometimes you just can't, it's not in the budget. So you got to, you got to, take forbearances and you have to do reassessments of loans. And, and so these, these loans tend to kind of become a monster of, of financial burden for most pilots that don't have the means to just pay it off the training that is uh, immediately. So yeah, I went through all those. Um, I'm, I'm no different than most people I've spoken with about getting big student loans, going to a big flight farm like we did. Um, and I saw this variable rate loan was a really, you know, low interest rate, tax deductible uh, every year. You know, I, I was able to take the hit and pay it off. And then I was paying double for a while because I could afford it. Um, and then I started realizing, you know, here we are now in a time when the interest rates are, are starting to creep up again. And I told myself the minute that my interest rate on this student loan, it's a private student loan, not a federal student loan. So no, I could not have requested the write-off. And even if I did, I don't know if I would because it's just a, it just becomes a big political taxpayer burden. But, but to stay with the loan, um, 
I told myself as soon as it got above 5% interest rate that I had enough paid off already to where I could have easily just paid cash and, you know, reduced my savings by a significant margin so that I wouldn't pay off that interest. But then I would not have that safety net that is a savings account that we should all have, especially in this career field. Um, so what I ended up doing is I got a loan out of my 401k. So I had, I don't know the exact amount, but let's just call it like $28,000 left on this student loan and which I've, you know, paid over two or three times over in terms of the original amount. And, uh, I took a loan out for my 401k. Now the 401k interest rate is a little higher. It's like 6.25 or something like that. But what happens is they sent me basically a check or they, they put the money in my account. So I took, I, I borrowed money from myself. I paid off the student loan to a net zero. So that shows up on my credit report as zero. So that's great. Now they automatically deduct, I think it's $280 per paycheck out of my paycheck uh, every cycle. And it, and it goes to pay off my, my 401k loan, my personal 401k loan. The interest that I'm paying goes back into my 401k. It doesn't go to a bank. It doesn't go to a third party. So I'm paying myself that interest that I would otherwise have paid a, a bank. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so I am the bank. My 401k, my retirement is the bank. There are zero penalties for doing this. The only stipulation is you have to dictate a certain time frame that you want to pay this off. I think I put three years, um, depending on finances and when I upgrade and all that kind of stuff, I'll hopefully knock that out much sooner. But if I can't, I can live with that couple hundred dollars or 300 bucks or whatever it is coming out of my paycheck every, every two weeks. Yeah. So yeah. yes, the student loan is 100% paid off. Now the method I did to do that, I got a little creative uh, and I used, I'm basically now paying myself off. Um, yeah. So that maintains the integrity of my savings account. And the only downfall or downside is now I'm paying interest to myself, to my retirement, I basically it's like putting a little five or 6% boost into my 401k every month. So, Hey, so wow. be it. Yeah. So, and that's the thing that, with inspiration. Yeah. That's the thing that people don't realize about flying though. And like when you take out these loans, is they're like, Oh, it's a student loan. I can, you know, totally get the, the same things that I can that a regular college student does. And you guys are hearing firsthand that it's a private student loan and that's what happens is you get in this and now you're 120 150 i don't know what it is up to now but let's just call it 150 because we all know it's expensive yeah. to to get that that student loan paid off and you know we're finally at a point making good money in the regionals that you can you know yeah not sweat going oh shit like i got to you know, hundred fifty thousand dollar loan, and I'm making Tony. What'd you make when you started? Twenty six thousand a year, first year. Bill, what'd you make when you started? Uh, right around there. 20, yeah. I think it's twenty four thousand. Yeah. So, like, you know, we're finally able to make like next year. I obviously I won't this year, but next year as a regional FO, I will pull in six figures. Okay. Took me close to 20 years to do that. <laughs> you did it in six months. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's what I'm saying is like, we're finally at a point at the regionals where yeah. you don't have to sweat a $150,000 loan and pay it off 20 years later. Yeah. Well, there was a point in, in the transition in like Bill and I's journey where you tried to get a loan and you couldn't get it because so many people, especially after the housing bubble, that burst in yeah. 2005, uh, so many people wanted to get a, a private student loan, but they couldn't do it because so many people were defaulting on their loans. And because yeah. it's a private loan, a lot of it was not, you know, they'd claim bankruptcy or they, you know, they, they would refinance their house and then walk away from their house and, and do a foreclosure and, and they, the loan would disappear and the house would be foreclosed on and then everybody's out. Right. So, um, well, and then that's yeah. another thing too, is with being a private student loan, you can, uh, 
actually throw it into a bankruptcy versus uh, uh, the federal student loan. Right. Which, but then you got a bankruptcy on your record. Yeah, and, and that's a seven-year hit. So what are you going to do yeah. for the next seven years? You want to start a family, buy a house, you know, and so now you're going, now you have to pay, you know, companies to help reestablish your credit. And so that the cost burden is there no matter what. Yeah. And, you know, if you're, you know, especially if you have a family and you, you, you own property, um, and it can be pretty scary to see, yeah. you know, to, to try to reestablish. Now, don't take any of the financial advice that you hear on the Squawk Ident podcast <laughs> as good advice. Like always consult your lawyer, uh, accountant, or a financial planner for <laughs> real advice. Do not please, take any advice from any of do. us because yeah. we have no idea what we're talking about. With that disclaimer complete, <laughs> Bill, just two more questions before we move on. Let's say you had to go back and whisper in your 16-year-old ear. What would you tell yourself? Um, I would tell myself to study a lot more. Um, and I would have told myself to get into this career earlier. Um, I, uh, I still have nightmares about deadline day at, uh, at the newspaper. Like, oh. oh my God, I got three stories to write and they're all due at noon and it's 1115. And, uh, yeah, I wake up in cold sweats from that, but I, rarely have any kind of nightmares or dreams that much even for uh for flying it's like you get home you're done and you can leave it all behind you what's up you i gotta pull chocks okay uh Bill, pleasure to meet you same here alex alex thank you so much for joining us and uh always a pleasure it was wonderful i'm glad to be on i'm sorry i we got uh things to do today yep well, so enjoy and uh, have a, have a good time at uh, was it church? No, oh, church was baby shower, uh, baby shower, baby shower, baby shower. Enjoy baby shower. Enjoy all the moms. Oh my god! It, it, it's a co-ed party, so you know all it's the moms so are going to be here, and all the dads are going to be over there. That's yeah. generally what we're going to do. Don't drink too so. much. <laughs> no, that was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bye. thanks, Alex. Have a good one. Yep. See you guys. Bye. Bye. See you. And then there were two. Now, here's a fun part of the show. Um, and we're actually running a little long today. Uh, I wanted to talk about a couple stories before we get into the, the whole, you know, spin event. Um, recently read a story and I was like, say what? Uh, snakes on a plane too? <laughs> a story from uh, <laughs> simplyflying.com. I'll put a link in the show notes as, as usual. Snakes on a plane too. United finds one on a Boeing 737 flight to Newark. A snake caused mass hysteria aboard a flight, a United Airlines flight, after landing as it moved about the cabin in <laughs> protest of the fastened seatbelt sign. Oh my God! All, all I could think of was the time I met Samuel L. Jackson when I was commuting one day, and <laughs> and, uh, and I, I I locked eyes with him. And I didn't say a word because I try to be as <laughs> respectful as possible to celebrities and not, you know, give them their privacy because they're people too. Um, but yeah, first thing that came to my mind was... Enough is enough! I have had it with these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane! Everybody strap in! I'm about to open some fucking windows. <laughs> I'll have to bleep a lot of that out. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, to, a United flight on Monday, October 17th, around 1315, that's 115 Eastern time, uh, passengers aboard a United flight were alarmed at the discovery of a snake on board the aircraft. United Airlines flight 2038 had just arrived at Newark Liberty International Airport, or Echo Whiskey Romeo, EWR, after a two-hour flight from Tampa in Florida. The Boeing 737, registered November 27252, had landed only a few minutes prior to the reptilian discovery, as the snake was found while the aircraft was taxiing to the gate. The snake had since been evicted. No injuries were reported. 
Shortly after landing, the cabin crew was first made aware of the onboard discrepancy when screams became emanating from the business class of the cabin. <laughs> Many passengers started screaming and pulling their legs up from the floor as a snake recklessly moved about the cabin despite the illumination of the fastened seatbelt sign. The reptile eventually meandered from business class to economy. Once at the gate, local airport police arrived to remove, to remove the stowaway. <laughs> Once police neutralized the serpentine threat, passengers could deplane with their baggage. Following the deplaning, the aircraft was thoroughly searched for another non-paying passengers. No other snakes were found aboard the airplane. Following the aircraft inspection, the 737 was quickly turned and departed for Fort Myers. The flight from EWR to RSW was only delayed about 20 minutes following the reptilian disturbance. So they, they never found why, how, it, you know, no one admitted that they brought a snake on board. It probably was in like a cart, a, like a catering cart of some kind. Catering. Yeah. You know, it, it was a crew meal. It was probably, yeah. I mean, it, the, uh, the airplane, uh, the snake ended up being not poisonous. It was a garter snake. Uh, the term garter snake commonly used to identify roughly 35 similar snake species in North America, all of which are relatively small, non-hazardous to humans. So, um, yeah, I, I don't like snakes. I, I, I admit it. I'm like Indiana freaking Jones. I hate snakes. Uh, <laughs> but I probably would have freaked out too. <laughs> have you ever had anything it's like this just happen? just one snake. Uh, snake? No, definitely not. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe some bugs in the plane, but that's about. I've I've killed my share of thing. cockroaches in the galley. I hate to say it, I've stepped right. on a few. Oh my god, it's a cockroach! Come back here, killer! <laughs> uh, yeah. Ugh. Bird strike. That's about as close. Yeah, I've had a few of those too. Those are kind of. Eh. They can be messy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, no snakes on a plane though. We didn't have to open the windows or anything. You don't have to like shoot shoot holes and have these hundreds of venomous snakes going through the cabin and, and kill both pilots and then have to get some young gamer to come up and land the airplane and because he has PlayStation time. Sir, have you got any experience piloting a jet aircraft? Oh yeah. F fifteens, F sixteens, ATM Warthogs, I've flown all that shit. And we're all thankful to have you, sir. What squadron are you with? Uh, the awesome fighting aces. Man, I'm telling you, the video gamers got their shit locked down tight. Sir, are, are you telling me that your only real flight time is at the controls of a video game? Uh, no, see, it's not, it's not a video game, all right? It, it's a flight simulator. Is that PlayStation or Xbox? PlayStation 2. Man, it's got an introduction by Chuck Yeager and everything. Well, obviously, as one of the pilots, I wouldn't be here to talk about that. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Folks, that, that is the plot for uh, Snakes on a Plane, by the way. Um, yeah, and I don't understand if they're... A true story. Yeah, it could, it could happen. <laughs> I'm just lucky. <laughs> you know, just, just happy that Samuel L. was there to save the day with a hand cannon. <laughs> yeah. Get those mother-loving snakes off that mother-loving plane. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Well, you know, Delta and Endeavor recently uh, had some headlines grace their those two airline names. Um, the reason is that on Facebook, uh, I was actually Alex, who had just left, um, sent me, hey, check it out. It's happening. It's really happening. Uh, and there was a headline indicating that Delta, which is a mainline carrier, and Endeavor, which is a regional carrier, were going to merge their pilots lists. And when I saw this, I immediately went to the interwebs and I thought, okay, there's got to be some kind of documentation on this somewhere. And I couldn't really find anything. Well, about a day or two later, sure enough, I saw what it really came down to an ALPA, an airline pilots uh, association uh, union uh, email or or some kind of press release saying that they came together to sign a joint resolution to support mutual interests. Well, what the heck does that mean? 
No, the, the companies, the VPs of the companies, the CEOs of both companies did not come out and say they're doing this. This was the union that said, hey, we got together and in an interest for both the company and the pilot group, we see that there's a, a pilot demand um, or a shortage of pilots and this would help. And we're willing to do this. If the company is willing, we're willing. And so both MECs or master executive councils of both the unions for Delta and Endeavor signed a letter of a joint resolution. And that's where this came from. I feel like for various airlines recently, that's been a rumor that if they have a wholly owned that, oh, they're going to merge, just mm -hmm. merge those pilots in with the legacy pilots. And uh, I don't know, maybe with the way economics are going nowadays that the uh, regional pay is so much closer to legacy pay now, it might make more sense. I don't know. Yeah, we've been talking about this for years. Um, that you know, if you if you got hired on, say at Legacy Airlines, and you start at the regional partner, that's that's your entry level, um, and then from there you would work your way up after say a few years. You know, maybe you can hold captain on a regional jet, and then after a particular amount of time spent or how whatever, you would then move or be allowed to bid bigger equipment. Now, the benefit to the pilot is that your seniority would start from data higher. Uh, your benefits would be all that more lucrative. Your pay scale would be all that more lucrative. Um, but there are so many questions that need to be answered, such as, well, does your pay scale that you started with at the regional side of this newly formed company continue on once you get to the different group pays. So it really wouldn't benefit the airline financially to do this because as of it stands right now, when you leave, say, Endeavor that has a agreement in principle for, you know, giving preferential, I believe, interview or hiring to their pilots over at Delta. So they come into Delta, they started year one pay. So they're on whatever group aircraft they end up on, group one, group two aircraft, however they call it. They end up at year one pay. And so they basically, they start over in their seniority. So it financially, it doesn't make sense to have a wholly owned uh, start with your seniority and benefits from day one and then transition to mainline unless you're that desperate for pilots and you cannot fill those seats. And I really don't think Delta has a problem filling seats right now. Yeah, no, I don't think so either. Now that would benefit Endeavor because as a regional pilot, they do, all regional carriers in the U.S. have problems finding qualified applicants. And really, these, these you know, low-time pilots, CFIs or fresh out of the military, you know, if you can get a job at the mainline, you will. And we've talked about this before, where there, there are some um, major airlines, like the low, ultra low cost carrier airlines, that are hiring straight out of CFIs, and that way they keep their pilots for longevity. Because if you're qualified to go anywhere, and you have, end up at a, a mainline or major airline or a regional airline, the second mainline's calling you, you're you're gone, you're out of there, right? So maybe you give them two three years, and now they have to not only fill your seat through the attrition, they also have to fill the seat for the future growth of the airline. So now they got to fill two seats instead of one. So what they're doing is these ultra low cost carriers are now hiring 1500 hour CFIs to fly an Airbus. And that way they're going to give them more in a couple of years because they don't have the PIC time, turbine time. So they'll stay there until they upgrade and hopefully then decide, well, I've already put five years into this company, I might as well stay here because I have five years seniority. I don't want to have to start all over again from the bottom of that seniority pay scale. So there are pros and cons to a move like this. I personally, for whatever it's worth, and again, don't take my advice as any kind of legal or professional representation, but for my experience in this industry, I don't see a mainline 
that owns a wholly owned to combine those certificates so that they can have a bigger pilot pool. I actually think financially that would not be sound for the company to make. It would be great for the pilots, don't get me wrong. And in Endeavor, if this actually happened, they would get a flooding of job applications from qualified applicants around the world. And with that said, there are mainline carriers that are now considering opening up their application pool to international pilots, something that hasn't been done for a very long time. What do you think, Bill? Do you think that a wholly owned, it would make sense for them to merge their um, into the main line like that? Um, I think they're going to run into the problem that a lot of these pay raises that they've gotten are making it so that the regionals aren't uh, aren't as cost effective as they used to be in years past. And now that the genie's out of the bottle and they have these pay rates, how are they going to, uh, they can't just like walk those back because that's going to kill that airline. So, I, you know, in two years for some of them, you, all of a sudden they're going to say, oh, you're, by the way, you're taking a pay cut and you're going back to, you know, the pay rates from two years ago. Everybody's going to be like, uh, see ya, you know. So, um, in that sense, um, I feel like it kind of makes sense, but I see what you're saying too with the, when you get over to the main line, you start at year zero or year one again and your pay goes back down. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that actually was a big deal after 9-11, um, years after 9-11, uh, the mainline carriers around the country, a lot of them were claiming bankruptcy in an effort to reduce uh, their creditors, what they owed their creditors, so that they can restructure financially. And some of the airlines that held out to the last second, one of them was Alaska and the other one was American Airlines. And I, I know for a fact that American Airlines hired an, uh, a firm that were known to be efficiency experts. And they did just millions of data points of collection uh, to see how American Airlines could, in fact, reduce their expenses and become more productive as an airline without having to claim bankruptcy. Um, and uh, I believe it was Bain & Associates uh, was the name of this efficiency uh, company. And they came back and the report uh, that the company ended up sharing with its employees at the time indicated that uh, they're actually very efficient in their operation. The problem is all their employees are topped out. They're senior. They're they're at top of their pay scales. And we're not just talking pilots here. We're talking from maintenance workers to gate agents to flight attendants to you know you name it to fuelers to rampers. Everyone you know the pay scale was tipped to to be too high. And the company tried different techniques. They tried doing the early payout, retire today, and we're going to give you like a half a year's pay, or one check, you know, kind of thing. And and some people took those early outs and others said, no, no way. Um, so there were so many different ways to try to be more efficient. And at the end of the day, the the report indicated that too many people were at the top of the pay scale. Now, there are other ways that you can get the top of the pay scales to leave. You can start closing bases and people are like, I'm not going to commute and they'll retire um, or they'll leave. Um, you can start uh, making life a little bit more difficult uh, in other ways, maybe not intentional, but in an effort to get the people at the top to leave. And I've lived through it. <laughs> Bill, I know you have too. You've seen these techniques uh, being demonstrated by these, these mainline carriers and even by the regional partners. Uh, in order, mm -hmm. in an effort, you know, you get rid of one senior pilot, you can hire two or three junior pilots to, to, for the same right. amount of money. Um, now, I was able to find the actual email or press release that went out from the uh, Delta and Endeavor MECs, uh, and it indicates that they signed a joint resolution to support mutual interests. The Delta and Endeavor MEC met in joint session on October 14th in advance of the Alpha BOD meeting. The group discussed the many common interests and challenges of their pilot groups and ways to work together. 
Together, the MEC reached a joint resolution in support of mutual interest, including the Delta MEC support for bringing Endeavor pilots and aircraft to the main line and Endeavor MEC support of the Delta pilots strike authorization vote. Each group separately passed the joint resolution. Staffing is a concern at the forefront of nearly every carrier in the fast-changing pilot labor market, including at Endeavor. The two MECs agree that the best way to ensure proper staffing for Delta's regional flying is to bring those pilots and aircraft to the main line. And we need to find real solutions to the broken fee-for-departure model, said Delta MEC Chair Captain Jason Ambrosi. The Delta MEC supports Delta management bringing regional aircraft and Endeavor pilots to the main line under one contract. In the resolution, the Delta and M Endeavor MECs mutually committed to maintaining and improving communication channels, coordinating efforts and objectives, sustaining a mutually beneficial cooperative relationship, and so on and so forth. So this is, this is what was announced, a joint resolution. It's basically like a declaration. We will work together if this is yeah. what the company does. So all you young aviators out there and regional pilots that got all excited, slow your jets, bro. <laughs> slow your jets. <laughs> uh, I don't see this happening in the near future, but if it does, it would be industry changing and the first step in repairing the fee for departure hub and spoke model. Now in the opener, we discussed life saving advice. So we wanted to expand on that here. Now, the day before June 7th, we talked about of 2006, the, when we all got together, you, myself, uh, and Andrea, um, all friends, all flight instructors, sitting in a room discussing our futures. I mean, you know, our lives could not have been more promising. And then you heard the news that Andrea never made it back to base. Um, what can you tell me about that day and what happened? Um, I had some friends over at Pan Am, but said, "Hey, you know, there's been a crash, and uh, you know, like, well, what happened? Who was it?" And uh, they told me, and I was just in shock. And uh, yeah, because I've been, I had just talked to her the day before, and uh, so yeah, and I. Gave you a call and let you know as well. And, but, yeah, you know, it's just one of those things. You just, yeah, you don't see it coming. Yeah. You know, life is precious. And every minute we have, every second we have with our friends, our family, and our, and the people that we admire, every, we need to remind ourselves, and especially in this time where there's so much noise from, these devices, these, these supercomputers that we have in our back pocket and from these tablets that we watch our, our movies and entertainment on and the, what we call mass media or news, we need to do everything we can to quiet that noise whenever possible and appreciate those moments. Um, I know that I've learned and I'm still learning to quiet the noise. I, I take steps every day in my life to quiet the noise. Um, now, that's not for everyone, and I'm not saying this is the way to go. Again, my opinion and my advice is my own. But uh, yeah, really, these kind of things, they always, always will blindside you, as it this event did for you and I. Now, we speculated what was happening. Um, I think the flight school, as it was getting information, it would pass it along to the chief pilots and, and then it would trickle down and you got some information and I was very appreciative that you called me later on and told me you know, what we learned. Um, the NTSB report uh, came back a little bit later uh, in 2007 and the report dated the 26th of March, 2007, indicated that uh, it was a two, two people lost their lives in a Cessna 152, registration number November 627 Papa Alpha. The NTSB investigators uh, traveled uh, to the site to do their report, to do their investigation. Um, a high-wing airplane descended into terrain during spin training. 
uh, for the review of from the recorded radar data, because uh, Cessna 152 does not have a digital flight recorder like like the airlines do, right? So the only information they had really is the radar data. Uh, the review of the recorded radar data found that the aircraft accident uh, happened as it appeared to last about 0.7 hours. The whole flight was 0.7 hours, during which time the airplane completed about seven stall spin maneuvers, all of which consisted of climbs and subsequently quickly quick losses of altitude, usually about 1,000 feet. The last two radar returns were at 5,500 feet and 3,400 feet from mean sea level, respectively, and spanned about 20 seconds. The flight instructor conducted an uneventful 1.2-hour spin training flight in the accident aircraft on the morning of the accident. So she actually went up uh, on an earlier flight, and at the time, Pan Am, only Pan Am um, chief pilots were checked out to do spin training because it is a very dangerous maneuver that is required in training because you don't want to think about in theory what would happen you want to actually experience the event and learn how to react and really in spin training for those listeners out there that don't understand what this is this is when you're flying an airplane you're flying at such a slow flight and for whatever reason an uncoordinated flight path happens which means one wing continues to produce lift, and the other wing uh, does not. So what happens is the aircraft goes into a, a stall and a spin. So it's, it makes like a corkscrew path. And in a Cessna 152 or a 150, uh, they're very stable aircraft. All you have to do really is let go of the flight controls. You let go of the yoke. And because of its inherent stability, the aircraft will pretty much erect its wing and fly straight and level for you. But you have to let go of the controls. Now, if you let go of the controls and then counteract the spin appropriately, you could recover just as quick as you went into it within you know, fractions of a second. And the only thing that would really be what we call the death spiral is if you do not relinquish the controls. You, you keep the stall attitude or the stall input into the aircraft in this uncoordinated stall, which is a spin. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, according to the NTSB report, the student pilot on the accident flight was enrolled in a course to receive his certified flight instructor certificate, which required the spin training. The student had never flown in a high wing airplane. Well, that's because at the Pan Am Flight Academy at the time, they primarily had Piper airplanes, and I believe they only had two 152s that they use exclusively for spin training. Um, yeah. So the first time you would, as a student there, the first time you'd be in a high-wing airplane is during your spin training for your CFI. Uh, two of his past flight instructors recalled several occasions in which he, the student, locked his grip on the flight controls, failing to relinquish control or allow the instructor to move the controls. The airplane was determined to be within allowable weight and center of gravity envelopes for the operation. The ground scars and wreckage deformation was consistent with the airplane impacting the ground in a spin. Post-accident investigation of the airframe and engine revealed no evidence of pre-impact mechanical malfunction or failure. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident are as follows. The failure of both the flight instructor and student pilot to regain control of the airplane in a timely manner during an intentional spin maneuver resulting in the collision with terrain. A factor in the accident was the instructor's inadequate supervision of the flight. Now, the first time I read this, I got to admit, being a former student of that flight instructor, I really had a hard time reading that because mm -hmm. she was one of my favorite flight instructors. She understood aviation, the laws of aerodynamics, the you know, flight instructing, the principles of learning. She was a fantastic instructor. What she didn't have was size. What was yeah. she, like five foot two? If that. You know, yeah. just the cute, she had just the cute, good looking uh, young lady from Scottsdale. 
um, a little older to be a, a young flight instructor. She wasn't in her 20s. I think she was 34 at the time. Um, really articulate, uh, just so much fun. And, and was a reason that I think, I, if I can speak for you, is there's a reason that we really were friends with her is because she was so professional and such a just pleasure to be around. You know, always mm -hmm. smiling, always kind of joking around, laughing, and she had a great personality. I really have a hard time reading that in the NTSB report. Um, I did find a little bit more detail on a website that I'm not going to – it's a it's a website that, that its whole purpose is about accidents and stuff like that, okay? Not just aviation, but, but accidents where there's fatalities. So I take it with a grain of salt, but – this website published this information about this accident from what they could find. Uh, the credibility of this information from what I know seems to be pretty credible, but again, it's not a main news outlet or anything like that. So I'll refrain from quoting the exact website. But in it, it says that uh, the deceased, I'll only use first names here, uh, Clint, 21, and his flight instructor died in a plane crash. Peoria Police Friday identified two people killed in a small plane crash near Lake Pleasant on Thursday. Mind you, this article came out in 2006. The instructor, Andrea, 34, of Scottsdale, and student, Clint, 21, of Phoenix, uh, whose family is from, oh, geez, Ypsilanti, Michigan? Y-P-S-I-L-A-N-T-I. Spilanti, Michigan? I don't know. They were killed in a... While their Cessna 152 was carrying them crashed into the hillside. It was unknown who was piloting the plane. Few details were released. But the Cessna was a 1977 model. It was listed as belonging to Pan Am International Flight Academy at Deer Valley Airport in the North Valley of Phoenix. Uh, officials at the academy would not say whether the flight instructor worked for the academy and would not comment on the student killed in the crash. The standard procedure. Uh, the student's family was obviously distraught from the accident and declined to comment as well. Uh, some more details. Uh, the accident uh, was a single engine aircraft crashed in a hillside area near the Quintero Golf and Country Club sometime between 3 and 4.10 p.m. Uh, the area uh, near Lake Pleasant was considered to be the uh, northwest practice area. Uh, any, any GA student pilot in Phoenix knows it. There's like four practice areas in the four quadrants uh, around outside of the uh, class, uh, is it Bravo airspace, the 30 mile oh. whale. Uh, and the, the north uh, practice area was the one where most of the student pilots from the Deer Valley Airport went. It's the closest one. They didn't have to deal with air traffic control. They could fly under the Bravo until they were clear. And, and that's where it happened. Um, they found the wreckage around 3.10 p.m., Peoria uh, police spokesman said. Um, the wreckage was found by uh, some construction workers that were in the area that uh, saw it happen and called the uh, 911 operators. The uh, FAA did not return phone calls for seeking comment to the reporter of this website. Uh, television news crews got the number off the airplane from a helicopter, and they were able to pass along all the information, and that's how the news of the story broke out. Um, tragic. So, mm. what could have been done? You know, we talk about this as flight instructors, or at least for myself, a former flight instructor. How do you get a student or a uh, you know, person at, at in the front seat of an airplane who grabs onto the controls and does not let go, they clinch up, how do you get them to let go? Touch them in some way. <laughs> it, you know, I mean, you, you got to slap them, purpose. punch them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it comes down to that, but uh, no, nah, I mean, if you're verbally trying to reach them and they're just not there, I, I think you got to do something physical just yeah. to snap them back into reality. Now, I remember this being a job interview question. Uh, for multiple jobs, uh, both as a flight instructor and uh, an airline pilot. And they asked me, you know, you're, you know the other pilot's doing something uh, and an accident is imminent. 
what will you do? And a lot of people said, oh, I'd punch him. I'd, pu I'd give him a Charlie horse. I'd punch him in the leg, I'd punch him in the arm. And that is not what they wanted to hear. Um, I've, during my interview prep for that Sky West interview we were talking about earlier, uh, I did read that uh, an, a really good answer is cover the other person's eyes. Mm. So you're, you have one hand to have on the controls of the aircraft, and the other hand you can just reach over and cover their eyes. Because if someone comes up and puts their hand in your face and covers your eyes, and if you're you know laser focused in on doing something that's incorrect, and someone covers your eyes, your response is to remove their hand from your face. So you will let go of the controls, theoretically, to move this hand out of your face so you can see. And by doing so, you're now relinquishing control of the aircraft, and no one got punched. Right. 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 Now, I don't know if it was you or someone else at the flight school was telling me that what was not published to the public was... Um, Andrea, they found bruise marks on her forearms, on the forearm that was on the side of the student, where they felt like she was hitting his arms to try to get him to let go. Now, mind you, when you're in a spiral spin and you're pulling G's, some serious G's, right? As the spin gets yeah. tighter and tighter and tighter, you're going to pull some serious G's. I can remember doing the flight training in that portion and I didn't black out, but I was having what's, what they call a, like a white out where you kind of get the tunnel vision, right? Mm -hmm. And I even said it, I'm like, I'm, get, I'm gonna black out. And the instructor immediately broke from the demonstration. And he goes, how did you feel? And I said, well, everything felt fine in the first half spin, but then in the second, third spin, as it, we got tighter, or I think it was a second spin, we got really tight and I could feel the G's and all the blood was like rushing from my head and I could feel like the tunnel vision happening. And he goes, that's good. He goes, that's why I did this. I wanted you to recognize that. And he goes, and what was the reaction that I had? And he goes, well, you just let go of the controls, really. And your plane just boom, came out of this spin. And he goes, yeah, exactly. So I, I felt like I had received some really superior instruction and experienced that. I can only imagine having that feeling on a five foot two frame, maybe 90 pounds, <laughs> right? Right. And you got a guy next to you that's maybe 180, who's locked up in the controls, 21 years old, and you're like, let go, let go, let go, and you're punching him, right? Because for all intents and purposes, she was striking him, and he, and he wouldn't let go. Um, and you, you never really know what to do, the right thing to do. You, you're got to be there in the moment. But yeah. in my suggestion, what I what I learned, and I thankfully never had to use it, was cover the eyes of the person next to you. Now, how easy is it if you're pulling two, two and a half G's to lift your hand up, move it across the cockpit and cover someone's eyes? That's going to be hard uh, physically to do in itself. Right. Just you might end up poking him in the eye instead, but maybe, you know, if you have a pen, you could, <laughs> um, <laughs> deadly weapon. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I ever did, uh, anything like this to you. You were, uh, you were pretty attentive, but I had uh, one student at least that uh, I always tried to come up with some kind of uh, way to distract CFI students. And so I dropped my checklist and uh, I'm like, hey, can you grab that? And he it was in the back seat on the floor. And he's turned around. He's looking away. Meanwhile, I'm trimming there. Playing. We're going nose up, nose up, nose up. And he's not even noticing. And like, I'm pretending that I'm looking for it, too. And then the stall warning horn goes off and, you know, he pops his head up and he's like, eyes are saucers. And then I kicked the rudder. We started going over and, you know, he grabbed it. He did a great job, but he learned from that point. I'm like, don't ever trust a student. Always, you know, that checklist can wait. Yep. Keep your eye on everything. Aviate, so. navigate, communicate. Looking for a checklist is not on there. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Man, well, you know, thank you so much for spending the time with us today, Bill. Uh, you know, it was it was fun to to look back and reflect on our time together, um, and a lot of memories came flooding back uh, just talking to you. And I really do appreciate everything you've done for me, 
um, and what you did for all your other students as well. Um, it really takes someone who is passionate about instructing and not doing it just to build time to make that difference and to make those memories and connections stick to you for a lifetime. And, I, and I, they have with you. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you. It's always been a pleasure working with you and you're a great student. And uh, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be where I am right now. <laughs> well, eh, maybe, or maybe at least not the direction you took. <laughs> <'Cause>, and, <laughs> right. and I could say the same. And I honestly, I could say the same. Um, you know, the the experiences we had together at Pan Am uh, were, after all the financial, you know, burdens of that are put aside, they were very positive. And I think that the education I got there was was very good. Um, would I have done things a little differently? Maybe, but I am where I am today because of everything that has happened to me and everyone I met. And so I'm very grateful. Uh, I want to wrap up the show today by saying thank you uh, to to you and to Alex for joining us today. A very long show, so this will be fun to edit. Yeah, <laughs> why not? Um, and you were talking about uh, some of the awesome bands that you got to play. Do you, are you still playing a lot of music? Um, mainly just in hotel rooms. I always carry a guitar with me, and that's where I get most of my practice in. Um, yeah, where I live, I haven't run, really run into anybody that uh, – to play with for a while so all right we're gonna have so, to change that next time i'm uh in the austin area maybe i don't know i'll uh I'll, I'll start putting out feelers i'm like hey do you need a uh guitarist for your band <laughs> <laughs> now if anyone wants to listen to any of your music from the past like uh sweet molly or him and i or anything like that is there a way a listener could potentially listen to your your music I don't think so. Um, there's some Sweet Polly CDs out there somewhere, but uh, if anybody remembers what CDs are, of course. As yeah. far as I know, there's nothing streaming or anything. So. Oh, we, we're going to have to like put something up on YouTube or something. <laughs> for sure. Well, thank thanks again uh, for reaching out and uh, spending time with us today. I uh, do appreciate it. And uh, hopefully out there, all of you listening, all five of you, uh, thank you for listening to the podcast. We uh, hope you enjoyed what we talked about on today's flight. And we ask you to pay it forward by sharing this podcast with your friends or online or on social media. Every listen does help. I was listening to uh, the latest episode of the APG podcast yesterday, driving to actually a couple days ago, driving to court. Um, as I mentioned in the onset and the opener of the show that, that I'm on a jury and and. So I have a responsibility to be in court every day and uh, Monday through Thursday. And it's been a great experience. And I'm here I am driving to the courthouse and listening to APG. And a listener sent in some audio feedback. And he had been, you know, had a, a really interesting career and interesting journey. And with the pandemic being in India, he was not flying for quite some time, for about two years, he indicated. And he said the only thing that kept him sane was listening to aviation podcasts like APG. And then he dropped the name of this podcast, uh, Squawk Ident Navy or Tony. And I almost ran off the side of the road. I was like, holy crap, <laughs> this is awesome. Like, listen to this. Um, and it just, it really felt good uh, to hear that, to get recognized for, you know, the hard work that I put in and all of us actually uh, on the show put in for this passion of podcasting and aviation and all that. So I just want to say thank you to all of you out there listening and participating and spreading the word. It absolutely is just a wonderful feeling to, to receive the support. Make sure you subscribe and follow the Squawk Ident podcast on whatever platform you're listening on. And you can also check out our website at www.aviatortony.com. That's Alpha Victor, the number eight, Romeo Tango, Oscar, November Yankee.com. You can check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as well. Just search Squawk Eyed In Podcast. And one final thank you to all of you for taking the time to listen to these grateful aviators. Keep the dirty side down out there, be safe, and take care of each other. Bye, y'all. Okay.
Can you fly this plane and land it? It's, it's an, an entirely, entirely different, different kind of flying. flying. 